to like completely change my route because everyone was in the right left train lane and I had to get over there. So, so, so. So we were just talking about it, and it's like if he had gone off the road 100 yards earlier, it would have hit us, you know? We were like right there. Um, so he drove on the sidewalk for a bit, then went back onto the road, drove on the road for a bit, then back up onto the sidewalk. <laughs> yeah, and in Romania, they did that a lot. Yeah, because the sidewalks are actually pretty big, and people yeah. just drive on them. I've seen that bumper sticker, I'm sure. If you don't like the way I drive, then stay off the sidewalk. <laughs> That's a, that's a South Florida motto, I'm afraid. Um, well, let's, uh, let's dive in and uh, start talking about uh, Don Quixote. Um, before we do that, we'll, we'll pray. Um, and I have a few uh, housekeeping things to mention as well. So let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you for uh, this uh, day that we have together to uh, study these works, to look at um, your truth, which we find in these books in front of us. We ask that you be with us, that you guide our conversations, that you uh, give us energy uh, at the end of this uh, long week to uh, engage well with this material and continue to learn about you. We ask you these things for Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen. Um, so, <clears throat> real quickly, uh, everyone, and I know Scott can't make it, but everyone else is going to be there tonight at 6, it sounds like. Um, I did put an address up. Does everyone have the address? Make sure you got it. Yeah, I and at a minimum, make sure you've got my number yeah. because uh, after four, I probably won't be checking my email regularly. So it's it's going to be easier if you text or or call me if you get lost or anything yeah. like that. So if you've got it, cool. Um, anybody give any thought to uh, what you're planning on writing on tomorrow for your essay? It's okay if you have it. You don't have to. It's not like you have to announce it yet. Yeah. Probably the 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 Iliad. Mm -hmm. Okay. Cool. Anybody else have any? Oh, Beowulf. Beowulf? Okay. Yeah, you like Beowulf, didn't you? <laughs> that was a fun one. Iliad. Iliad? Okay. What about you? Probably Song of Roland, actually. Okay. Nice. Pretty soon you'll make a movie out of it. <laughs> It'll have much more nuance. There won't be these like, black and white characters. <laughs> and you won't, be, you won't be writing, I don't think, right? Well, I'm, I'm going to write a little something on Beowulf. Beowulf. Gotcha. Okay. But it's because you're auditing, it's, yeah. it's your choice. So don't feel any pressure to if you don't want yeah. to. Um, so uh, a few other uh, things to mention. Tomorrow will be our last day. Um, don't cheer. <laughs> you're, supposed to, you're supposed to show tremendous sorrow. <laughs> um, and we will be out of here by noon at the very latest tomorrow. So whatever plans you have to make, just know going forward, noon will be the, the uh, what is it, terminus ad quem, <laughs> the, the, the last uh, time that you have to be in here. Um, uh, in that, in that uh, regard, um, we will be finishing all of the material that's in front of us by tomorrow morning um, with plenty of time for you to uh, write your essay. So I told you I'll give you an hour uh, to write the essay. Um, Scott, I think you had asked if I cared if it was handwritten or typed. I don't. So you know, write it in a manner that's convenient for you. If you do type it, just email it to me when you leave. Um, but you'll write the essay and then you're welcome to get up and, and go. So, um, any questions about any of that? Okay, so uh, we're going to uh, look at Don Quixote and finish up our conversation of, with, about him. Um, I did want to just uh, talk a little bit as we, we uh, continue our discussion with Don Quixote about uh, how we as Christians and uh, many of us who are, are teachers or leaders or pastors in our, our our own ministerial context, uh, think about a, a genre like epic, um, and, and think about um, looking at scripture, uh, 
with, with a view for heaven. Um, and I, I say that because um, you'll, you'll quickly pick up on the fact, I think, in Don Quixote that there is sort of a, a, a for lack of a better word, very Christian <coughs> lens that uh, Cervantes has, that he's approaching this material with. At least that's my opinion. So, um, you know, think of, think of, um, think of Don Quixote, this, this uh, uh, kind of mid-level uh, landlord who decides after all of his readings that he's gonna go and be a glorious knight. You know, and you know enough of the plot so far from the first eight chapters that you know, he, he uh, saddles up this, this broken down horse, uh, Rocinante, uh, thinking it's his war horse, and off he goes. And he's going to uh, stand up for truth and justice and all of these things, and in the process, win the heart of Dulcinea, this lovely woman who's gonna fall in love with him. Um, along the way, he also uh, gets a squire, a, a very poor uh, farmer, <laughs> who, uh, among other things, uh, doesn't seem to have a very good relationship with his wife, which might be the reason why uh, he's happy to follow along uh, with uh, Don Quixote. Um, I would submit to you that, as we talked about yesterday, there's a sense in which uh, Cervantes is undermining a lot of the, the epic genre that we've seen so far, but he's also rebuilding it to a great extent. Um, and I, I would submit to you that he's, he's, a bit, he's, he's rebuilding it on profoundly Christian terms. Um, to understand that a little bit more, you have to understand a little bit more about Cervantes. And maybe if I tell you a little bit more about him, it will facilitate a little more discussion here. But um, he was, among other things, a soldier who uh, lost the use of one of his hands during a battle. He was captured by pirates and held in captivity by pirates. He uh, wanted all of his life to be a dramatist. He wanted to be uh, the, the Spanish Shakespeare. We don't know if he knew anything about Shakespeare, but if you think of Shakespeare, they're contemporaries. So Don, uh, Cervantes' goal was to be the, the Spanish Shakespeare. Um, and he was a failure. Nobody wanted to go to any of his plays. Um, so to make money, uh, he did something that's, that's uh, probably even more difficult than going and practicing law to make money. He became a tax collector. <laughs> and then got nabbed for misappropriating funds. <laughs> or at least that was the allegation and spent several terms in jail, okay? Now, if I tell you these things about uh, Cervantes, does it help you then when you read Don Quixote and you look at this man who is a knight, who is going a knighting, <laughs> uh, and is constantly getting beaten up by everyone around him? Does it, does it now feel like a little autobiographical almost? Uh, I, I think it does, that's, that's my take on it. It feels somewhat autobiographical, it's almost like Cervantes is saying, this is the story of my life, uh, to some extent. Um, and this is, what, this is what happens to you when you choose to follow your dreams, rather than choosing to follow the path that would make money. Um, thoughts on that? Do you, do you see that, I mean, to some extent? If I, if I told you those things about him, can you, can you start to see a little bit of that in Don Quixote? Um, is that a Christian view of things? That's too broad a question. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, like the fact that you try to do what you feel like is your duty mm -hmm. and you are persecuted. Like you could say that, I mean, okay. um, yeah. in that way. I'm not sure if that's what you're looking for. But yeah. Well, I mean, I'm looking for whatever. <laughs> yeah, so I guess um, initially what you, you said yesterday about this man, and I don't really know how to understand it yet, but if this man is actually seeing the potential in people, the potential in life, yeah. mm -hmm. um, it kind of grabs your imagination, and he's just living in a very mundane world, mm -hmm. but there's something much more that could be happening. He has a vision of things uh, that's always getting him in trouble with, because he's, he's willing to suspend uh, uh, belief a little bit, and imagine that uh, this, this uh, prostitute he sees is actually a pure woman who is going to be his lovely bride. Um, he has this ability to suspend uh, belief uh, that this uh, broken down uh, failure of a farmer is going to be a wonderful squire. Um, I think that there is something that is actually very Christian about that, 
of that vision of life that uh, we look at things uh, not always as they are, but as they could be. Um, it's a very grace-saturated way of thinking. Um, but it's also realistic, uh, because over and over and over, uh, Don Quixote's uh, grace-filled perspective gets the daylights bitten out of, er, er, beaten out of him, doesn't it? I mean, he's, he's over and over and over uh, taken advantage of. Um, and this will be true both in this work, the first part of Don Quixote, okay, the first book that Cervantes published, and also, if you're, if you're uh, not already familiar with this, the fact that uh, Cervantes late at the very end of his life published a second book about the journeys of Don Quixote. We think that he did that because somebody else had already stepped in and tried to write the, the, uh, you know, the second part. And so you literally had two competing versions of Don Quixote part two. Uh, one written by this other Spanish author who was trying to kind of step into the, the arena and take that mantle. And Cervantes steps in and says, no, I do it better. Let me do it. Um, but in any event, both of those are going to be stories about both, both Don Quixote the first book and Don Quixote, the second book, are going to be stories about a man who sees the world not as it is, but as he wants it to be. Uh, not as it is, but as it could be, uh, with this, this vision of things. Um, you could say, and I think um, this will make more sense after you've taken the comedy class, after you've taken the comedy class, but you could say that he has a comic vision of things. That he is able to see in a, a, uh, a prostitute uh, the possibility of a, a pure bride. He's able to see in a broken down farmer the possibility of a squire. He's able to see in a broken down inn a castle. Okay? Now, is this just simply ridiculous? I mean, some people have read Don Quixote and said, this is simply a farce. This is simply ridiculous. Uh, this is simply Cervantes undermining earlier uh, uh, genres and patterns, especially the, the genre of knightly literature. And unquestionably, he is doing that. But I would submit to you, and I think we'll see this more as we, we dive into the text a little bit, that one of the things that he seems to be doing is actually rebuilding the epic genre on a profoundly hopeful and profoundly uh, uh, grace-filled uh, kind, of, kind of new platform. Um, what say you? What do you think? Does that make sense? Not so much. Anybody take issue with that? Yeah, I mean, I, I would be <laughs> I, I haven't seen it yet with, uh, in the first chapters. Yeah. I, it, there's something at the end where it becomes much more, um, I don't know, like Christian themes or yeah. anything. Like I would be more, but it, it really does pass. It's just a, kind of a, a humorous, mm -hmm. just he's kind of convinced himself of the way uh, he wants to see things. And it's on the basis of a book, which is interesting. Mm -hmm. as far as a Christian stance, but it's on the basis of a book that everything changes for him, but it's so clumsy to where I don't know if it's that profound, but it is very cool to look at it that way. Is it ever sad? Yeah. It is sad, isn't it? Um, you know, there are times when you almost have to look away. Um, when, he's, when he's speaking to the innkeeper, and the innkeeper is just fleecing him, um, and he's talking to the innkeeper as if he's, you know, this grand knight, and he's speaking in this very elevated language. And you can see the innkeeper's like, "Man, I'm going to take advantage of this guy like crazy." And you, you almost have to look away, like I can't believe how bad this is going to go for him. What do you think, Jose? Um, just a little bit skeptical. I, I just think like there are times when he's actually hurting people. Mm-hmm. And with his like, folly. Yeah, and this yeah. is like. Could it be talking about mental illness at some point? Maybe, yeah. Of like, you know, this, you know, maybe he, he wants he wants to see something good in people, but at the same time, he'll see like merchants passing by, and he's like, these are my enemies, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. So what, I don't know if he's necessarily yeah. thinking the best of them necessarily. It has all the hallmarks of uh, severe mental illness. Doesn't yeah. it? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it really does. Right. Um, there's, there's, you know, to just kind of put it crassly, I mean, yeah. the, the guy seems like he has a screw in this. Yeah. Right? Um, yeah, so to me, this is more like, sometimes I read it like, you know, like seeing Don Quixote is like seeing a schizophrenic homeless guy walking down Federal yelling at people, you know, like. Yeah, there's a, and, there's and a bit of that, too. 
that's sad. It, it is sad. Sense. Yes, it is sad. Um, you turn away not just because uh, you're you're laughing, but sometimes you turn away because you're you you feel sorrow for this person and you feel sad even though the person himself doesn't feel sad because he's not capable of, of getting what's going on. Yeah. Uh, that's that that is true, isn't it? Um, uh, many people have noted, as we said yesterday, that it's, it's Don Quixote is in, in many ways the first modern novel. I think you, you mentioned yesterday, Sam, what is a novel? What would you guys say a novel is? Why, why might people think this is a novel? Let's think about a definition of a novel. It's going to be a work of fiction, mm -hmm. right? So it's a, typically a fictional work. It often has a, a character development, and it has a clear plot of some kind. Okay? So if you think of, of a novel, a work of fiction, which has a, a strong character development in it, okay, and a clear plot of some kind, a clear story, um, you see that there's a, a, a sense in which what, what uh, Cervantes is doing here is telling this, this story with a character in it who is modeled after earlier um, uh, genre, earlier uh, epic heroes that kind of fit that genre and fit those kind of, kind of check those boxes. And yet at every level and at every point, he seems to kind of like cut against what you would expect. You know, so he's a knight, but uh, um, uh, he has a broken down war horse. You know, he's looking for a wonderful lady who will be impressed by his, his exploits, but invariably it's a prostitute in a name. Um, so you, you're finding in this that uh, what Cervantes is doing is developing his character of Don Quixote um, in a way that you were not expecting. He's not just following the prior types. Okay? When, you read, when you read Roland, I mean, Roland is speaking in an almost formulaic kind of way. Um, is he not? I and mean, we saw some of those set pieces you know, where Roland and Oliver are like bowing to each other in chivalry and it's highly contrived. When Don Quixote does that, uh, it's contrived, but it's contrived to mock it or to undermine it. So there's a, there's a level of character development there that's just really interesting to a lot of people. Did you find it interesting? Or just maybe, maybe concerning? Like you just feel concerned for the guy, like why is he out on the street? I think it's oddly endearing. Uh, yeah, it can be a little endearing, isn't it? Like at some point you kind of find yourself rooting for him in a way that you don't feel like you should. Yeah. <laughs> because you feel like he's kind of screwless, but at some point you're kind of hoping that the world he sees is the world that he could truly inhabit in order for him to live out his kind of wildest imagination. One of the, um, one of the things that often accompanies the assessment of Don Quixote as the first modern novel is the assessment of Don Quixote as the Spanish Bible. Um, now, he said that Homer, <clears throat> when he wrote the Iliad and the Odyssey, was writing the Greek Bible. We said that um, uh, the Song of Roland is in many ways uh, a proclamation of the nobility of, of, of chivalry in Europe in a, in a, a not, not propaganda, but a, a, a song about the nobility of, of Europe uh, as they go to war with Islam. There's a real sense in which what Cervantes is doing is writing a Bible for the Spanish language. Um, and to a very great extent, these, these characteristics can be seen in later Spanish literature and even Spanish culture. Quickly going to be out of my league here in terms of what I know about, but that's a common assessment of Don Quixote. Do you find any truth in that? Yeah. This book is like everything in every Hispanic country. <laughs> I don't know if there's a comparable kind of, so, yeah, so like to English, I don't know if there's like one book that would be as veneered as this one yeah. is in Spanish. Yeah, so talk a little bit about that, I mean, how so? Like what, what kind of characteristics of this book then do you see in, in Hispanic <clears throat> culture? That would be hard for me to say because I think this, this Spanish culture is so much different, not only because of time, but also sure. it being Spain, sure. not necessarily where I grew up. Mm -hmm. Um, but like even when I went to Spain, they would be like, oh, there's Toledo, and this is where this yeah. part of the book happened. Yeah. And even when I was like in kindergarten, they, I, I knew about Don Quixote, and hmm. like the windmills, and like hmm. all these cities, those stories. So I just feel like there's some sort of connection that like I, I feel like, you know, if, 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 if Greek and Roman boys were reading, hmm. you know, being taught the Iliad, and hmm. knowing about Achilles and all these things, hmm. I feel like 
I knew about Sancho Panza, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, from like mm-hmm. since I was five. Huh. Huh. Uh, so it and it's just it's the go-to book for the Spanish language. At and least that's how it's been presented to me. And I didn't really. I, I don't think the rest of us, for the most part, probably did. I mean, I knew the the phrase jousting at windmills. I've I've heard the phrase you know quixotic. You know, if you if you say that somebody is embarked on a, a task that is uh, basically impossible. You know, that's often described as either jousting at windmills or a quixotic kind of task. Um, but it really isn't in the mainstream of, of English culture in the way that, say, Shakespeare would be, the King James Bible might be in terms of the language. You know, it, 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 it isn't that, that kind of um, central novel or, or epic. But many people have said that this has, has essentially functioned as the Bible of Spanish culture. Um, if you think more broadly, not, not of, of Spanish per se, as in pertaining to Spain, but of Spanish language culture, so the, the cultures that the Spanish language has influenced, um, I wonder if that's also the case. Is there, is there say, in Latin America, a, a popularity of Don Quixote at all, or not at all? That may not be something you know, but I'm just curious. I, I mean, as much as I can see, and as much as I can say, I think, I can see traces of, and again, every, because we have so many different dialects that sure. are in the, in the country yep. and such. I think in Colombia, and that's the only part I could probably speak about, is just this sense of sarcasm mm-hmm. <laughs> in mm-hmm. speech, mm-hmm. and very brusque and very rude and very crass. Mm-hmm. That is how I read Don Quixote. It's mm-hmm. very, I don't know, poignant yep. and, and sarcastic. And I think that's, that's like, Colombia is a sarcastic country, and, and for many reasons we we talk very crude. Mm-hmm. So, and again, I mentioned um, when this began to be translated into English in the 17th century, it was, it was common for English translators to kind of brush over that and, and iron that out, you know, so that wouldn't be as apparent, uh, it wouldn't be proper. Um, yeah, it's 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 really a delight to read just in its own right. It it reminds me of some of my family and my travels in the south of Europe as opposed to the north of Europe. If you think of, of the difference between the culture between the north and the south of Europe. So if you travel in say, you know, the north of Germany, <coughs> you travel in Scandinavian countries, everything is run according to very, very strict rules and very strict patterns. Uh, there is a clear sense that everyone is kind of in their place doing their job and no one would disobey those rules. You know, so when you say you're in, in the northern part of Germany, at least if you get to, you know, a, a, a stop, you know, a crosswalk and there's a stop signal, you will find 30, 40 Germans standing at that, at that crosswalk just waiting. If there are no cars anywhere, they just wait. Changes, and they all go. <laughs> Of course, you know, I grew up in South Florida, <laughs> so, you know, when I was living in Germany, uh, I got to one of those, and it was late at night, and, you know, there's a don't walk, and I kind of looked, and there were no cars, and so, there I go. And there was a, a German on the other side who started screaming at me, nine, <laughs> nine, you know? I thought there was something wrong, I thought it was like having a heart attack or something, so I like ran over to him, and I'm trying in my very, very broken German to understand what he's saying, and he's just pointing like, it says don't walk, <laughs> like, what <are> you <laughs> like what's wrong with you? Um, and so I asked, I asked one of the, the women who taught in the language program there, I said, you know, is, is this common? Like, do most Germans just obey rules like this? And she said, oh yes. I said, well, if you were at that crosswalk, and let's say it's late at night and there's you know, no cars coming, would you go? And she said, I would think about it. The only thing would be if there was a child anywhere nearby, I would not do it because I would never set that kind of horrible example for a kid. <laughs> I was like, whoa. <laughs> uh, but they, they, at least in the part of Germany I was in, I was in Mainz, um, they will ticket you and put points on your driver's license if you walk against the do not walk at a crosswalk. Mm. That's what I was told. Mm. So it's just, it is very organized, very orderly in a really profound way. Everything is, is cared for, everybody kind of knows you know, the rules and knows how things are done. Um, when I took this language program in Germany, the very first day of the class was simply spent telling you how this language program was run and that it was the most rational, logical way to run a language program. Like they just wanted everybody to know we put a lot of thought into it. This is the best way to do this. Um, they, they just think like that. 
Then you go to Rome. <laughs> you know, it's not, it's not the same. There is a, just a difference in culture between the northern part of Europe and the southern part of Europe. You know, so my family and I went to Rome and, and spent several days in Rome a couple years ago for my birthday. It's this time of year. My birthday is Monday, so it was you know just two years ago, and uh, it was a gift to me from from my wife. But you know, we traveled to Rome with our two little boys, and you know, we we kind of read ahead about some of what to expect. We'd never been to Rome before, but that that is broadly speaking Latin culture. And I'm, I'm, very broadly speaking of Latin culture, but a Southern European culture. Uh, and it's just very different. It's just very different. The way things work are just remarkably different from the north of, of Europe. So, you know, you get in and you have to negotiate with the taxi cab driver. And the taxi cab driver is trying to basically rip you off because there are no set rates. You know, so we negotiated well and got the rate that we wanted because we, you know, studied up on it get into the taxi, and then it is like this harrowing, death-defying, you know, journey to our Airbnb as he goes, you know, 100 miles an hour on these, you know, cobblestone streets, cutting people off. He has his, his cell phone out, and he is, he is talking to his mother um, on the cell phone and texting his girlfriend and making very, very nasty gestures to other cars <laughs> while driving. <laughs> and I'm just sitting in the back with my boys like, we are gonna die. Um, then he ended up robbing us, which is the, the oh. roughest part. So he dropped us off in a dark alley, and when we went to pay, he swapped bills with us. So he, we gave him a 50 uh, euro note, and he gave it back as a 10, and was like, hey, he didn't give me the right amount, and so then we're fumbling around, we give him more, and then he kind of speeds off as we're realizing, oh, you know. But great with the kids, you know, he's like, oh, the bambinos, you know, he's talking to the boys as he's robbing us. I mean, it's just, it's just a different, it's a different culture. I loved Rome. Like, if I could go and live anywhere in the world for the rest of my life, I would want to live in Rome. There's a relaxed attitude. You know, when we went into restaurants, I mean, the the chef came out and sat at the table with our boys and talked to our boys. They pulled up a chair for my son's little cat that he had with him and put the little, you know, stuffed cat on the chair. At one of the restaurants, the grandma of the chef came out and wanted to take the boys on a walk. She was like, you guys just eat. I'll, you know, take them and, you know, I'll smoke and walk with them down the street. And, you know, it's just, it's just different. It's, it's more relaxed. It's more easygoing. It's, 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 thinking more of things as they could be rather than as they really are for the, you know, the rest of us. Um, so I don't know, I, 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 I see in Don Quixote this kind of scattered, disorganized, somewhat unrealistic view of the world that I also have experienced when I traveled in those parts of Europe and on the whole found it to be a really delightful experience. Um, I wouldn't necessarily want to go to the hospital there because, you know, it might get lost somewhere in the hospital and never heard from again. But there's something about that just view of life that we need to kind of relax. You know, family is good. Uh, having children is, is good, you know. We, the first restaurant we went to in Rome, there were people in the restaurant just staring at us. And that's usually a very bad thing because my boys are very loud. So I'm thinking, you know. And then people come over and they're like, we're so excited to see your kids in our restaurant. You know, they're like talking to us and, and you know, encouraging us about having kids and how lovely the kids are and all that kind of stuff. It's like, man, this is a different view of the world. So I don't know if any of you have experienced that. Have you traveled in cultures that are more like that, just kind of a looser, uh, more, you know, uh, the, 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 the uh, Italian, I think, would be la dolce vita, you know, the sweet life kind of thing. I don't know, have, have you? For the first time we went to uh, Rome, we decided that uh, they don't drive cars, they aim cars. <laughs> aim cars, that's right. <laughs> oh, it's true, isn't yeah. it? It's terrible. And of course, they have, instead of having stoplights, they have the roundabouts. Mm -hmm. And of course, you take your life into your hand trying to get into the, yep. the roundabout. Yep. Uh, so. yep. Yeah, where, you know, where, where we were living at the time in Scotland, you know, they do have roundabouts, but everyone is so polite about going mm -hmm. into the roundabout that it actually gets dangerous that way. So it's like, no, 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 you go. I have all day, don't worry about it. You know, in Rome, it's just like, you know, a, a death trap. Uh, anybody else travel in, in that kind of culture, you have Jose? I mean, is, is that a fair, I, I don't mean to stereotype all cultures. I but. guess Colombia has changed. We used to be like that a lot too. Okay, how has it changed? Um, 
So when I was really young, maybe like early 2000s, um, the, yeah, stores closed, like they would take siesta time. Uh-huh. Uh, so that kind, that happened, and I think it still happens in some small towns, but um, Mexico, we go there every year with Calgary, and, and we take students, okay. and um, we were, I think this year we were scheduling to go and do an outreach, mm. uh, and we're like, let's just do it after lunch, right? Like, why not? Because mm -hmm. we have nothing else to do, we didn't have anything to do until six, and then we went to the town, and it was like a ghost town. Yeah. Uh, and then we're like, there's no one out here, huh. and everyone was sleeping. Huh. And then we were like, well, at least let's let's go to the store and like chill out until six, and it was, every store was closed. Huh. So we're just like in the middle of town by ourselves. We're like, oh, we'll just play soccer, I guess. I don't know. And it was, I mean, uh, I forgot that that was a thing. And then we're talking. I was talking with my wife yesterday, and she mentioned she grew up in the Philippines, and she's like, yeah, like I don't know if I could ever go back there. Everyone's so relaxed. Uh -huh. And I guess we live in a culture that's like very like work, 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 work. But in the Philippines, they're like, eh, you know, and like in Colombia, it's the same thing. Where like, if you say like, hey, show up there at three, people show up at six. They're like, yeah, you know, it's traffic and like, the yeah. kids. And, yeah. and you're like, dude, <laughs> you're it's, three hours late. <laughs> and those of us who do live in South Florida, you do get a, a sense of this kind of culture to a great extent. There's a great influence of that down here. Oh, yeah. um, and I've, I've, to a great extent, grown up with it and worked in it. Um, at times, it can be jarring. If, you, if you're used to a very kind of regimented way of thinking about life, it can be very <coughs> just, just category busting. Yeah. Uh, but there's a lot that's just really wonderful about it. Um, and I think that that's a bit of what we're seeing in, in Cervantes, is if you compare um, these two medieval uh, uh, epics, if you compare like the Song of Roland, you know, a traditional French uh, song about chivalry, to Cervantes, there's a sense in which you're getting that difference. Okay, you're getting the difference between knights who uh, go and fight for God and fight and, and fight and die bravely, and a crazy knight who's like just a little bit cracked, who thinks he's a knight when he's actually not, and he's off jousting at windmills. I mean, there's just a there's there's a difference in perspective. Um, I don't want you necessarily to think that one is better than the other, but it's helpful for understanding culture to understand this different outlook world. Um, as we'll see again when we, when we take the comic class, there's a, great, there's a great extent to which this is actually a comic outlook on life, um, to, to see things as they might be rather than they, they are. Um, did you want to say something? The only hesitancy I have with that is I don't want to, you know, I just have to be permitted to accept yeah. I don't want to read something into the text that's not really there. And mm -hmm. I would love to know if if Cervantes mm -hmm. wrote with that in mind. If yep. he didn't, I can I can look at that and it can be a fruitful uh, read, but I, I really do, I would love to know if there's a, a very good justification that Cervantes actually meant to, to show that um, in a way that his outlook was actually yep. like Christian. So here's, here's where we come up against something that happens a lot in fiction, which is we don't always know why an author wrote a particular work. You know, we, we saw this when we, when we read Homer, didn't we? I mean, when you read the Iliad, you could read the Iliad and the entire work, in fact, as a screed against war. This is what happens when people go to war. Don't go to war. You can read it as a glorification of war. War is amazing. We should go to war more. You could read it as something in between. War happens, and here is a glorious depiction of war when it does have to happen. The, you're, you're stuck with that ambiguity when you interpret these kinds of texts. Um, but I take your point, and I, I think to make really strongly definitive statements about a text like this, you would probably need something a little bit more from the author, which in Cervantes' case we don't have. Um, but this is also, this is a helpful time, I think, to talk about how when it comes to fiction, off, authors are often playful about those sorts of things. Um, if Cervantes did write, for instance, a prologue, the one we're going to look at here in a minute, it will actually be more confusing to us about its purpose than helpful. <laughs> so we'll take a look at the prologue if you like. And I'll show you that he tells you why he wrote the book. Uh, and his description of why he wrote it is more confusing to us than helpful. Um, because sometimes that's how fiction works. Um, <clears throat> I think Scott had his hand then. So. Is there anything happening in 
Spain's history at this point that would give us any clues to what's going on as well? Because yeah. it feels like... Yeah, so uh, Spain at this point, I mean, end of the 1500s, beginning of the 1600s, uh, Spain has a vast empire. Um, if you think of the conquistadors, people like Cortes, who have come to uh, uh, conquer the New World, um, they have a vast empire. They have a vast amount of wealth that's come about as a result of the gold from the New World. Um, they have massive armies that uh, historically were the dominant armies in Europe, uh, but they've also faced some tremendous defeats. Uh, they attempted to invade England uh, with, the, with their, their vast navy and storms came up and shattered their ships. Um, so Spain is, Spain is in a moment at Cervantes' time when they have this vast empire and for close to a century they've been the dominant power in Europe, but that power is starting to wane, if that makes sense. Um, is that helpful for the context? Yeah. I was just going to say, in relationship to, uh, to your comment, this is a very contemporary thing because, mm -hmm. and it, you even see it in the law and in politics, that yeah. it's a originalism, uh -huh. which is a really focused on what the writer intended, yeah. you know, yeah. even in the Constitution, that type of thing, <clears throat> versus the more contemporary uh, deconstructive mentality mm -hmm. and so forth, that uh, the reader is the one. It's, it's, in other words, the focus is on the reader. It's, yep. it's, the focus is not on what the writer intended, yep. but the focus is on what the reader takes yep. away. And so it actually, there's a, a one famous uh, uh, academic article where it's the, uh, uh, the author, is the, the name is not important. Mm -hmm. There is no such thing as the honor. author is dead, kind of. Thing. Yeah. yeah, it's mm -hmm. just, and this this fly, uh, ties into I think the the contemporary education and so forth in terms of the dead white males. You know, what they did is irrelevant, and not only is it irrelevant, but it's biased and prejudiced and and so evil. When we look at somebody like Cervantes, uh, what I want you to hear from me is here's one way of reading him and this may be the right way. There probably was a very clear goal that he had when he, when he set out to write this. So what you, what you shouldn't be hearing from me is we, there, there was no such goal. Okay, that, that's not what I'm saying. What I am saying though is that we have to kind of build a case for what it was that he was trying to do by looking at the text. Does that make sense? Yes. So I'm not saying there is no meaning, it's all floating around, it's all nebulous. There, there is meaning in the text, and there probably was a goal that he had in writing it, but the complexity that arises when we deal with fiction is that sometimes the author is very evasive about what that goal is, in part because there are multiple possible meanings in the text, and perhaps he wants to give us that complexity. He wants us to, to wrestle with that, uh, which is kind of what we're doing here. But that's not the same thing as kind of what you're talking about. That there is no author, there is no meaning, uh, let's look at the prologue, which won't help us at all. <laughs> um, <laughs> prologue. Uh, first, first line. Idle reader. Without my swearing to it, you can believe that I would like this book, the child of my understanding, to be the most beautiful, the most brilliant, and the most discreet that anyone could imagine. But I have not been able to contravene the natural order. In it, like begets like. And so what could my barren and poorly cultivated wits beget but if the history of a child who is dry, withered, capricious, and filled with inconstant thoughts never imagined by anyone else, which is just what one would expect of a person begotten in a prison where every discomfort has its place and every mournful sound makes its home. Okay, so he's talking about the writing of this text and he mentions, he says, I would love it to be a really glorious text, but I wrote it in prison. Okay, uh, probably, he, he's probably referencing the fact that uh, he wrote it while he was, he was in prison himself. Um, turn the page. I wanted only to offer it to you plain and bare, top of the next page, unadorned by a prologue or the endless catalog of sonnets, epigrams, and laudatory poems that are usually placed at the beginning of books. Guess what, about, what he's about to do? Give us a catalog of sonnets, epigrams, and laudatory poems, okay? But he's, he's trying to apologize. He's like, I really wanted to just kind of leave that stuff out. For I can tell you that although it cost me some effort to compose, none seemed greater than creating the preface you are now reading. I picked up my pen many times to write it, and many times I put it down again, because I did not know what to write. 
And once, when I was baffled, with the paper in front of me, my pen behind my ear, my elbow propped up on the writing table, and my cheek resting in my hand, pondering what I would say, a friend of mine, a man who is witty and wise, unexpectedly came in and, seeing me so perplexed, asked the reason. And I hid nothing from him and said I was thinking about the prologue I had to write for the history of Don Quixote. And the problem was that I did not want to write it yet. Um, I did not want to bring to light the deeds of so noble a knight without one. Okay? So what you're, what you're seeing there is also an a, a, um, aspect of the novel that Cervantes is, is one of the first people to kind of uh, uh, develop, which is the idea of an author. Okay? He is speaking as an author about this work he's about to write. And he's speaking with a great deal of, of um, um, ambiguity. Okay? He says, uh, I'm giving you idle reader, instead of something like gentle reader. Idle reader is a delightfully uh, odd way to address your reader. Okay? Um, I'm speaking to you idle reader, and I'm telling you that when I wrote this book, I really, really wanted to just get right to the facts and write something that would be glorious, like one of these old epics. Um, leave out all those you know, sonnets and poems and things that have kind of come into the, the genre. Um, but then, uh, as I was thinking about what I was going to do, I had to sit down and write a prologue and tell you what I was going to do. And that's really hard, because I'm not sure. <laughs> and somebody, my friend even came in as I was getting ready to write the pro prologue, and as I'm sitting there kind of pondering it, and it's like, get on with it, what's going on? And, and I had to just say, I just don't know what I'm doing. Okay, this is, this is playing with you. He's, he's yanking your chain. Um, and he's gonna yank our chains a lot more. Um, and he's gonna yank the chains of other people who have, he thinks, done a bad job of this. Um, so uh, he's, he's being instructed by his friend on how to solve this quandary that he's in. Um, so turn to page five, um, just the next page over and at the bottom. Um, uh, to which he said, so this is his friend giving him suggestions on how to solve these problems. First, to solve the question of the sonnets, epigrams, or laudatory poems by distinguishing titled people, which you need at the beginning, you must make a certain effort and write them yourself. And then you can baptize them with any name you want, attributing them to Prester John of the Indies or to the Emperor of Trezebond, both of whom, I have heard, were famous poets. And if they were not, and certain pedants and university graduates backbite and gossip about the truth of the attributions, you should not give to, and then it's a term for money, for what you say, for what they say, because even if they prove the lie, they won't cut off the hand you use to write with. Um, now, he's lost the use of one of his hands, so there's probably a play on that. Um, but do you also see what he's saying? He's, he's saying, um, why not just steal stuff from other people? Okay, right? We gotta, we gotta start with some sonnets, and I'm kinda stuck. I didn't really wanna have sonnets. I'll just steal sonnets from other people, and then I'll attribute them to whoever I want. And if people call me on it, well, what are they going to do? Okay? This, is, this is an author talking about the process of being an author. It's a very common thing in a novel to have a very, very powerful author. And he's, he's one of the first to do this sort of thing. Um, skip down. As for citing, just a few lines. As for citing in the margins the books and authors that were the source of the sayings and maxims you put into your history, all you have to do is insert some appropriate maxims of phrases in Latin. Ones that you know by heart, or at least that won't cost you too much trouble to look up. So that if you speak of freedom and captivity, you can say, non bene pro toto, uh, libertas veneditur auro, um, which is given to you there as liberty cannot be bought for gold. Uh, and then in the margin, you cite Horace or whoever it was that said it. Uh, uh, if the subject is the power of death, you can use palida, mors, aequo, pulsat, pede, paparum, uh, tabernas, regumque, turis. Um, pale death comes both to the hovel of the poor wretch and the palace of the mighty king. Uh, if it's friendship and love that God commands us to have for our enemies, you can turn right to Holy Scripture, which you can do with a minimum of effort, and say the words of God himself, ego autem nico wobis, diligite inimicos westros, but I say to you, love your enemies. If you mention evil thoughts, go to the gospel, de corre exuint cogitationes malae, um, for out of the heart proceed evil thoughts. You get the point, okay? So he's saying if, if you're stuck, just go with the tried and true and attribute it however you want. If they call you on it, so what? Okay? This is a very nonchalant, slapstick, slapdash approach to writing. Um, and and he's, he's saying, this is what I'm going to do, but it's because a wise friend told me to do it. Um, 
it's, it's uh, for people who have, have uh, struggled to, um, to, to put words on a page. This is, this is actually pretty, uh, pretty enjoyable. Um, why come up with something new? Why even come up with something old? Take something old and attribute it to someone new and who will even know? <laughs> That's the idea. Not good advice for like writing papers, by the way. Um, so then we begin with this like dedication uh, to the book, which is hilarious. And I'm, I'm curious, Jose, how this came across in Spanish, um, if, you, if you look at this, or if you go back and look at it in Spanish, how this would come across. But in essence, um, he writes this, this poem, and we'll only read a little bit of it, that has this odd rhythmic pattern where uh, the very last syllable of a word is left off, okay? So uh, here's the dedication to the book. If you reach goodly read, O book, you proceed with call. You cannot by the be called a stumbling nit. But if you are to impick and pull the loaf on time, <laughs> I mean, you get it, right? it's, it's goofy. <laughs> uh, it's not really a great poem. <laughs> we don't know if it really was going to rhyme or not, do we? Um, it has some other really awesome stuff at the very beginning, which I, I uh, highly recommend you take a look at sometime on your own time. Uh, my favorite, though, is a dialogue between the horse and someone else in the form of a sonnet. So the very last line before we jump into chapter uh, one is a, a, a dialogue between Babieca and Rocinante, a sonnet. Okay, Rocinante is the horse, right? So why is it, Rocinante, that you are so thin? Too little food and fat, too much, uh, far too much labor. But what about your feed, your oats and hay? My master doesn't leave a bite for me. Well, senor, your lack of breeding shows because your ass's tongue insults your master. He's the ass from the cradle to the grave. Do you want proof? See what he does for love. Is it foolish to love? It's not too smart. You're a philosopher. I just don't eat. <laughs> Do you complain of the squire? Not enough. How can I complain despite my aches and pains of master and squire? Or is it major domo or nothing but skin and bone? Like Rocinante. Okay, it's just goofy. It's, it's, it's playing with you, it's enjoyable, it's, it's, it's clever and witty. Um, let's uh, jump into chapter one. Somewhere in La Mancha, in a place whose name I do not care to remember, a gentleman lived not long ago. One of those who has a lance and an ancient shield on a shelf and keeps a skinny nag and greyhound for racing. An occasional stew, beef more often than lamb, hash most nights, eggs and abstinence on Saturdays, lentils on Fridays, sometimes squab as a treat on Sundays. These consumed three-fourths of his income. The rest went for a light woolen tunic and velvet breeches and hose of the same material for feast days, while weekdays were honored with dun-colored coarse cloth. He had a housekeeper past 40, a niece not yet 20, and a man of all work who did everything from saddling the horse to pruning the trees. Our gentleman was approximately 50 years old. His complexion was weathered, his flesh scrawny, his face gaunt, and he was a very early riser and a great lover of the hunt. Some claim that his family is from Quixada or Quixada, for there is a certain amount of disagreement among the authors who write of this matter, although reliable conjecture seems to indicate that his name was Quixana. But this does not matter very much to our story, and it's telling there is absolutely no deviation from the truth. Okay? Do you really think that that's true? Okay? This is one of the complexities of a novel. I'm about to tell you something, and I promise you that all of it is true. You can almost be sure that if a novel begins with that, much of what's going to follow isn't going to be true. Is that upsetting? No? Yes? Reading a novel. Hey, you're reading a novel. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's, that's, that's what's, what's going on here. So this is, this is not a systematic text. This is not uh, going to teach truth through clear exposition of truth set out in a systematic way. It's going to teach truth by atmosphere and by implication. Um, by inference. Um, our man is, is very caught up in reading, uh, page 21 at the top. In short, our gentleman became so caught up in reading that he spent his nights reading from dusk till dawn and his days reading from sunrise to sunset. And so, with too little sleep and too much reading, his brain was dried up, causing him to lose his mind. His fantasy filled with everything he had read in his books, enchantments as well as combats, battles, challenges, wounds, courtings, loves, torments, and other impossible foolishness. And he became so convinced in his imagination of the truth of all the countless grand eloquent and false inventions he read that for him no history of the world was truer. Okay? So what is happening here is he's depicting his, his gentleman as having gone out of his mind due to the reading of books like The Song of Roland. Okay? 
and the whole genre that emerged out of Roland, um, these, these chivalrous uh, texts. Bottom of the page, the truth is that when his mind was completely gone, he had the strangest thought any lunatic in the world ever had, which was that it seemed reasonable and necessary to him, both for the sake of his honor and as a service to the nation to become a knight errant and travel the world with his armor and his horse to seek adventures and engage in everything he had read that knights errant engaged in, righting all manner of wrongs and by seizing the opportunity and placing himself in danger and ending those wrongs, winning eternal renown and everlasting fame. Now, is that not a theme that we've seen over and over in Epic, right? He is, he is 50, okay? This is a midlife crisis. He decides not to get a Porsche, okay? <laughs> he decides to get a war horse and go off uh, knighting and grailing. Um, I'll pause there for a moment and tell you if you, if you take to this kind of critique of uh, courtly literature, uh, there is a book by Mark Twain called A Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court. Taking a little detour for a second here. Uh, have you ever heard of a Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court? Um, it's one of Twain's lesser known works, but it's brilliant on this topic uh, because what he does is he depicts a man who is a late 19th century uh, factory uh, overseer who gets hit in the head in an argument and goes back in time to King Arthur's Court. And the story is Twain's send up of courtly culture. Um, now, You'll have to read it, but I would argue that Twain is also sending up his own culture to a great extent and saying, we have a lot, <laughs> we think we're a lot better, but we're actually not. You'll have to read it yourself to make that determination. But there, there are just some wonderful lines as, you know, Twain is a master of comedy, but there's some wonderful lines in it. One of them is that this, this man who shows up in this, this uh, Arthurian court is treated as an honored guest. And one, one of the first nights, the queen of the court calls in this, this band to, the, this whole group of, singers to sing a song for him. Um, and he says, they sang very badly. And so the queen had them all executed. And he said, I almost appealed the decision, but they had sung very badly. <laughs> so that's Twain for you. But he, he spends a lot of time talking about how this modern man who knows about dynamite and knows about railroads is now using that knowledge back in this ancient context. You know, He's predicting an eclipse. He's using his dynamite to perform a miracle, those kind of things. Uh, but he has this great story about, uh, about all the knights in the court who were always going a grailing, he says. They were going grailing. They were out looking for the Holy Grail. And he said, it got to the point that one group would go out and get lost looking for the Grail. And then a new group would have to go look for the group that got lost looking for the Grail. And then another group would have to go looking for that group. And he said, by the end of it, nobody knew that they were looking for the Grail. They were just looking for the last grailing group. <laughs> you know? It's wonderful. Um, Cervantes is, is sending up uh, this kind, of, this kind of, of story, this kind of epic. Um, uh, uh, look, if, you, if you're curious as to uh, uh, what kind of, of um, things are influencing him, right, right uh, uh, at the bottom of the long paragraph on page 21, we read that Don Quixote would have traded his housekeeper and even his niece for the chance to strike a blow at the traitor Gwenelon. Remember, remember him? <laughs> Gwenelon? Okay, so he's reading these stories and he wants to uh, get his name um, uh, Im Im immortalized as one of these noble knights. Um, so he decides to dress himself in armor and uh, to, to head out. So let's see um, on the next page how he does that. Um, uh, it starts just at the bottom of, of page 21, so we'll start right at the bottom. The poor man imagined himself already wearing the crown, won by the valor of his arm, of the empire of Trebizond on, at the very least. And so it was that with these exceedingly agreeable thoughts, and carried away by the extraordinary pleasure he took in them, he hastened to put into effect what he so fervently desired. And the first thing he did was to attempt to clean some armor that had belonged to his great-grandfathers, and stained with rust and covered with mildew, had spent many long years stored and forgotten in a corner. Um, there, there's something really delightful about this. I mean, we talked about um, uh, how Priam, as an old man, puts on the armor and it doesn't seem to fit. There's an incongruity in that. Uh, putting on your great-grandfather's armor is goofy. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't work. And it is a, it is a um, hearkening back to a, a prior time. 
you know, it would be, you know, me dressing up like a World War I, uh, uh, you know, soldier. And you go, well, that, that just doesn't look right. That's what this looks like. Um, he did the best he could to clean and repair it, but he saw that it had a great defect, which was that instead of a full salad helmet, helmet with an attached neck guard, there was only a silk, simple headpiece. But he compensated for this with his industry, and out of pasteboard, he fashioned a kind of half helmet that, when attached to the headpiece, took on the appearance of a full salad. It was true that in order to test if it was strong and could withstand a blow, he took out his sword and struck it twice. And with the first blow, he undid in a moment what had taken him a week to create. <laughs> he could not help being disappointed at the ease with which he had hacked it to pieces. And to protect against that danger, he made another one, placing strips of iron on the inside so that he was satisfied with its strength and not wanting to put it to the test again, he designated and accepted it as an extremely fine salad. I mean, that's amazing. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's goofy. I mean, it's, 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 it's laughter inducing. Then he went to look at his nag, and though its hooves had more cracks than his master's pate, and it showed more flaws than Gonola's horse, that tantum pelis et ossa fuit, it seemed to him that Alexander's Bucephalus, that's Alexander's horse. You know the story of Alexander, he tames his horse because Bucephalus won't um, allow anyone to ride him, and Alexander is a young boy shows that he's going to be a hero by taming Bucephalus because he realizes that Bucephalus is scared of his shadow. And so he walks Bucephalus in a, in a place where he won't see his shadow, jumps on him, and tames him. It's what an epic hero does. El Cid's Babieca were not its equal. Remember Babieca in this sonnet with Rocinante? He spent four days thinking about the name he would give it. For, as he told himself, it was not seemly that the horse of so famous a knight and a steed so intrinsically excellent should not have a worthy name. He was looking for the precise name that would declare what the horse had been before its master became a knight errant and what it was now, for he was determined that if the master was changing his condition, the horse too would change its name to one that would win the fame and recognition its new position and profession deserved. And so after many names that he shaped and discarded, subtracted from and added to, unmade and remade in his memory and imagination, he finally decided to call the horse Rasanante. Um, uh, <laughs> the note is telling you this, but it's really funny. It, mean, it means like prior nag, okay? Like it used to be a nag. <laughs> um, a name, in his opinion, that was noble, sonorous, and reflective of what it had been when it was a nag, before it was what it was now, which was the foremost nag in all the world. Um, this, is, this is really brilliant. He's naming the nag and saying, now, now you are a war horse um, because you have the right name. I mean, this is, this is theological too, isn't it? I won't travel down this path too far, but the idea of getting a new name and a new identity is, is there. That is a Christian theme, is it not? Having given a name and won so much to his liking to his horse, he wanted to give one to himself. And he spent another eight days pondering this and at last called himself Don Quixote. Which is why, as has been noted, the authors of this absolutely true story determined that he undoubtedly must have been named Quixada and not Quixada, as others have claimed. In any event, recalling that the valiant Amadis had not been content with simply calling himself Amadis, but had added the name of his kingdom and realm in order to bring it fame, it was known as Amadis of Gaul. He too, like a good, soul, a good knight, wanted to add the name of his birthplace to his own, and he called himself Don Quixote of La Mancha thereby to his mind clearly stating his lineage and country and honoring it by making it part of his, his title. Um, uh, the, the note is telling you this, and I, I would encourage you to give some thought to this, that Quixote or Quixote um, uh, there means a piece of armor that's like over the thigh. I mean, it's not the part of the armor you hang yourself after. It's just really bizarre. Um, it's, it's kind of scattered humor. Um, La Mancha is a place with no kind of history whatsoever. Um, so uh, uh, chapter two, having completed these preparations, he did not wish to wait any longer to put his thought into effect. Impelled by the great need in the world that he believed was caused by his delay, for there are evils, evils to undo, wrongs to right, injustices to correct, abuses to ameliorate, and offenses to rectify. One morning before dawn on a hot day in July, without informing a single person of his intentions and without anyone seeing him, he armed himself with all his armor and mounted Rocinante, wearing his poorly constructed helmet. And he grasped his shield and took up his lance and threw the side door of a coral 
he rode out into the countryside with great joy and delight at seeing how easily he had given a beginning to his virtuous desire. Um, it's hot. <laughs> that's, that's really the joke there. Uh, Mark Twain makes quite a few of those jokes in the Connecticut Yankee as well, that one of the worst things about knighting, about being a knight, is just being in all this armor when it's really hot and how hard it is to keep cool. Um, it, 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 um, you, you were talking, Jose, about a certain level of crassness in, a, in, other, in other cultures. Um, certainly our culture is plenty crass at times. But this, this undermines the nobility of the armor, doesn't it? It's not just that he has this makeshift ridiculous helmet that's like kind of all askew and kind of clamped down in ways. And I showed you last night, you know, it's like stuck there. So even when he eats, he's got to have a straw through it. Um, it's not just that. It's that it's really hot. Um, and making that kind of observation just undercuts the nobility of epic, doesn't it? It, it, it cuts the legs out from under it. You know, it's, it's uh, giving a love poem to someone and then saying, oh, that was probably a waste of paper. Like, what did you use? Did you use valuable paper? <laughs> and it's like, yeah, it's all gone now. <laughs> Everything's just, the balloon is popped. Um, what do you think of it? Do you find that enjoyable or do you find that offensive? It's fine if, you, if you're offended by it. Are you offended by it a little bit, Sam? No, I, uh, I just think it's yeah, very humorous that yeah. it's just, yeah, it's contributing to, to some of his, uh, I guess, persecution he's going to himself. Yeah. Oh, yeah, he's going to be, he's going to be severely persecuted, isn't he, um, uh, for all of these, for all of these troubles he's taking. Um, I showed you uh, last night the passage at the inn, which is one of the best. Um, but um, uh, Don Quixote uh, decides that um, he is going to go on uh, a, a mission to uh, rectify injustice. And we'll see one injustice that he rectifies. Um, he comes across in chapter 4 a farmer, um, sorry, a herdsman who is, is beating a young man. Um, so top of page 36 in chapter four. Pulling on the reins, he directed Rocinante toward where he thought the cries were coming from. And after he had taken a few steps into the wood, he saw a mare tied to an oak and tied to another was a boy about 15 years old, naked from the waist up, and it was he who was crying out. And not without cause, for with a leather strap, a robust peasant was whipping him and accompanying each lash with a re reprimand and a piece of advice. Now this is just, this is humorous, right? It's a reprimand and a piece of advice. It's detailed. For he was saying, keep your tongue still and your eyes open. And the boy replied, I won't do it again, Senor, by the passion of Christ. I won't do it again, and I promise I'll be more careful from now on with the flock. And when Don Quixote saw this, he said in an angry voice, discourteous knight, it is not right for you to do battle with one who cannot defend himself. Mount your horse and take up your lance. For a lance was leaning against the oak where the mare was tied. And I shall make you understand that what you are doing is the act of a coward. Now, there's a lot going on here that's really interesting. Uh, one of those things is that I mentioned to you that chivalry, coming from the French word cheval, which means horse, is the standard that applies only to the upper crust. The peasants don't have that rule uh, applied to them. They don't live by that rule necessarily. Um, if a peasant is captured in uh, combat, for instance, the peasant is usually killed. Uh, it's only a knight who's going to be ransomed because the knight is wealthy or has family who are wealthy. Um, Don Quixote is humorously treating a peasant as a knight, and his reader laughs at that. But there's, there's something interesting about that, is there not as well? I mean, it is, it is taking these standards that would otherwise govern a, a high elite and saying they actually apply to everyone, which is humorous, but is also something that I think appeals to us to some extent as well. The peasant, seeing a fully armed figure ready to attack and brandishing a lance in, his, lance in his face, considered himself a dead man, and with gentle words he replied, Senior knight, this boy I'm punishing is one of my servants, and his job is to watch over a flock of sheep I keep in this area. And he's so careless that I lose one every day, and when I punish his carelessness or villainy, he says I do it out of miserliness because I don't want to pay him his wages. And by God and my immortal soul, he lies. You dare to say he lies in my presence, base varlet? said Don Quixote, by the sun that shines down on us, I am ready to run you through with this lance. Pay him now without another word. If you do not, by God who rules, I shall exterminate and annihilate you here and now. Untie him immediately. 
Uh, exterminate and annihilate is a really good combination, isn't it? Um, it's not, he's, he's not really good with words. <laughs> um, um, the peasant lowered his head, and without responding, he untied his servant, Don Quixote, asked the boy how much his master owed him. He said wages for nine months at seven reales a month. Don Quixote calculated the sum and, and, and found that it amounted to, seven, to 73 reales. <laughs> uh, is that right? <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, told the peasant to take that amount from his purse unless he wanted to die on their account. The terrified farmer replied that by the danger in which he found himself and that both he had sworn and so far he had sworn to nothing, the total was not so high because from that amount one had to subtract and take into account three pairs of shoes he had given his servant and a real for the two bloodlettings he had provided for him when he was sick. All of that is fine, said Don Quixote, but the shoes and the bloodletting should compensate for the bows, blows you have given him for no reason. For if he damaged the height of the shoes you paid for, you have damaged the height of his body. And if the barber drew blood when he was sick, you have drawn it when he was healthy. Therefore, by this token, he owes you nothing. The difficulty, Senior Knight, is that I have no money here. Let Andres come with me to my house, and I'll pay him all the realities he deserves. Okay? Now, here we're going to have Don Quixote at his finest. All right? He is going to permit the boy to go back, <laughs> trusting the honor of a fellow knight. Is it going to work out well? No. <laughs> Do you know <laughs> from the setup that it's not going to work out well? Yes. Okay, so he's led you down this path where you know that this guy, this, this farmer, this, this uh, herdsman who's beating his, his uh, servant is not an honorable man, but Don Quixote doesn't know that. Don Quixote has gone from threatening him with death to trusting him implicitly. Okay, and that's what Don Quixote does. Was it you, Scott, that said that that ends up hurting people sometimes? Um, were you saying that earlier, or was that you, Sam? Um, yeah, you know, that, that we see that here, don't we? I mean, the, the, um, the fate of this uh, boy who's being beaten is a terrible one, because what the peasant does is takes him home and beats him more, okay? And Don Quixote can't intervene now. I mean, this is, this is how Don Quixote's world works. Uh, he sees things in black and white, he sees things in a very simple way, but he can't fix problems. Um, uh, let's, uh, let's look at uh, a few more uh, passages here before we finish up with Don Quixote. A few more kind of emblematic, um, a few more emblematic scenes. He finds uh, uh, a good squire for himself. Um, bottom of page 55 in chapter 7. During this time, Don Quixote approached a farmer who was a neighbor of his, a good man, if that title can be given to someone who is poor, but without much in the way of brains. <laughs> in short, he told him so much and persuaded and promised him so much that the poor peasant resolved to go off with him and serve as his squire. Among other things, Don Quixote said that he should prepare to go with him gladly because it might happen that one day he would have an adventure that would gain him in the blink of an eye an insula. <laughs> you know what an insula is? <laughs> it's like, a, like an island, right? Um, that's what the note says, I think, yeah. Um, and he would make him its governor. <laughs> so, with these promises and others uh, like them, Sancho Panza, Panza, for that was the farmer's name, left his wife and children and agreed to be his neighbor's squire. Here we have knightly duties. We have this heroic duty, don't we? Um, remember Aeneas is leaving Dido. He's leaving even his, his city of, of Troy. And he's going to found Rome. So Sancho Panza, uh, here's this promise that one day we might have an adventure where we'll win an island. <laughs> I mean, it's very broad. Uh, Don Quixote is like the worst uh, pyramid scam salesman ever, right? <laughs> like, <laughs> one day <laughs> we'll win an island, maybe, and then I'll make you its governor. Uh, but Sancho Panza is lacking in brains, and so he agrees to go. Uh, uh, so um, Sancho Panza, uh, at the bottom of, of the next page, bottom of page 70, uh, uh, 56, uh, rode on his donkey like a patriarch, with his saddlebags and his wine skin, and a great desire to see himself governor of the insula his mas master had promised him. Don Quixote happened to follow the same direction and route he had followed on his first sally, which was through the countryside. Um, skip down. Senior Knight Errant, be sure not to forget that your, what your great promised me about the insula. This is Ponza talking. I'll, I'll know how to govern it, no matter how big it is. To which Don Quixote replied, 
You must know, friend Sancho Panza, that it was a very common custom of the knights errant of old to make their squires governors of the insulas or kingdoms they won. And I have resolved that so amiable usage will not go unfulfilled on my account. On the contrary, I, I intend to improve upon it, for they sometimes, and perhaps most times, waited until their squires were old and after they had had their fill of serving and enduring difficult days and nights that were even worse. They would grant them the title of count or perhaps even marquis of some valley or province of greater or smaller size. But if you live and I live, it well might be that before six days have passed, I shall win a kingdom that has others allied to it, and that will be perfect for my crowning you king of one of them. And do not think this is any great event, for events and eventualities befall nights in ways never seen or imagined, and I might well be able to give you even more than I have promised. I mean, this is an utterly unrealistic promise, of course, right? Uh, but he is, remember, he's so obsessed with the epic genre that he, his, his brain has been addled. Uh, and he is so obsessed with the idea that knights have adventures and conquer great kingdoms that he's sure it has to happen to him. Maybe in as little as six days. You know, it's just bound to happen. Um, this is my favorite part. If that happens, replied Sancho Panza, and I become king through one of those miracles your grace has mentioned, then Juana Gutierrez, my missus, would be queen, and my children would be princes. Well, who can doubt it, Don Quixote responded. I doubt it, Sancho Panza replied, because in my opinion, even if God rained kingdoms down on earth, none of them would sit well on the head of Marie Gutierrez. That's, that's his wife. Um, you should know, senor, that she isn't worth two, and then it's a word for money, as a queen. She'd do better as a countess, and even then she'd need God's help. <laughs> Leave it to God, Sancho, said Don Quixote, and he will give what suits her best. But do not lower your desire so much that you will be content with anything less than the title of Captain General. I won't, senor, San Sandra, Sancho replied, especially when I have a master, as distinguished as your grace, who will know how to give me everything that's right for me and that I can handle. All right, two more uh, uh, quick scenes and we'll be done with Don Quixote. Uh, the next chapter uh, uh, talks about uh, two things that we have to remember uh, when, we're, when we're thinking about uh, Don Quixote. If you were to, say, uh, write on Don Quixote as, as epic, um, we're going to have a battle scene, okay? And we're going to have this, this glorious approach to someone that he wants to win honor from, a, a wonderful woman that he's going to think of as Dulcinea you know, the, the sweet lady. Um, the battle is going to be against what? The first battle in chapter eight, the last, last one you read. It's the windmills. It's the windmills, right? Um, and this is, this is one of the most famous scenes from Don Quixote. Uh, like I said, the, the phrase jousting at windmills uh, is, is in common parlance. Um, top of, of chapter eight, as they were talking, they saw 30 or 40 of the windmills. You page there? Yes, so page 58. As they were talking, they saw 30 or 40 of the windmills found in that countryside. And as soon as Don Quixote caught sight of them, he said to his squire, good fortune is guiding our affairs better than we could have desired. For there you see, friend Sancho Panza, 30 or more enormous giants with whom I intend to do battle and whose lives I intend to take. And with the spoils, we shall begin to grow rich. For this is righteous warfare and is a great service to God to remove so evil a breed from the face of the earth. What giants, said Sancho Panza. Those you see over there, replied his master, with the long arms. Sometimes they are almost two leagues long. Look, your grace, Sancho responded, those things that appear over there aren't giants, but windmills. And what looks like their arms are the sails that are turned by the wind and make the grindstone move. It seems clear to me, replied Don Quixote, that thou art not well versed in the matter of adventures. These are giants, and if thou art afraid, move aside and start to pray, whilst I enter with them in fierce an unequal combat. Um, do you see the epic gesture here of monsters? These are, these are giants in the land that Don Quixote is going to task himself uh, in unequal and fierce combat uh, to destroy. Um, next page. Fear not, cowards and base creatures. Page 59. Fear not, cowards and base creatures, for it is, it is a single knight who attacks you. Just then a gust of wind began to blow and the great sails began to move. And seeing this, Don Quixote said, even if you move more arms than the giant Briarus, you will answer to me. And saying this and commending himself with all his heart to his lady Dulcinea, his imaginary woman, asking that she come to his aid at this critical moment and well protected by his shield with his lance in its socket, 
He charged at Rocinante's full gallop. You know what that has to look like, right? <laughs> and attacked the first mill he came to. And as he thrust his lance into the sail, the wind moved it with so much force that it broke the lance into pieces and picked up the horse of the knight, who then dropped to the ground and were very badly battered. Sancho Panza hurried to help as fast as his donkey would carry him. You know what that looks like too, right? And when he reached them, he discovered that Don Quixote could not move because he had taken so hard a fall with Rocinante. It's brilliant. <laughs> I mean, this is great. Um, <laughs> I'm glad we had this towards the end of the class because everyone's kind of tired and this is, you know, this is epic, but it's epic with a twist. Um, uh, but do you see how, how Cervantes is aware of the genre? He is following in the path of the genre, and at every, every opportunity, he is he's undermining it and giving you a different vision of what it could be. Okay? So here is, here is Don Quixote on Rocinante, as fast as Rocinante can go uh, into battle. Um, now, uh, last, last bit before we finish with uh, Don Quixote, we have to meet his lovely lady. Um, he finds a woman who's in a, a carriage and comes up alongside her and begins speaking to her on page 63. Uh, Don Quixote, as, as has been said, that one paragraph down there, was talking to the lady in the carriage saying, Oh, beauteous lady, you can't, you, uh, thou canst do with thy person as thou wishest, for the arrogance of thy captors here lieth on the ground, vanquished by the, this my mighty arm, and so that thou mayest not pine to know the name of thy emancipator, Know that I am called Don Quixote of La Mancha. Right? He doesn't let her ask his name. That's a really great. He says, I know you're going to pine after my name, so I'm just going to give it to you right away. <laughs> um, Knight errant in search of adventures and captive of the beauteous and peerless Donna Dulcinea of Tobosa, and as recompense for the boon thou hast received from me, I desire only that thou turnest towards Tobosa, and on my behalf appearest before this lady, and sayest unto her what deeds I have done to gain thy liberty. Um, he's, he's a good knight, but he falls in love with a lot of people. He has this imaginary woman he's going to. Now he's in love with this one, and he says, you've got to introduce the two of us. Okay? Uh, one of the squires accompanying the carriage was a Basque, who listened to everything that Don Quixote was saying, and seeing that he would not allow the carriage to move forward, but said it would have to go to Tobosa, the squire approached Don Quixote, and seizing his lands in bad Castilian, and even worse, Basque, he said, <laughs> that's, that's a very funny phrase. Is that not? There are two dialects. Okay, so in, in, in bad Castilian and even worse Basque. Um, go on, mister, you go wrong by God who make me. If I don't, if, if don't uh, let carriage go, as I be Basque, I kill you. Okay, so that's an effort to, to capture that bad dialect. Don Quixote understood him very well and replied with great serenity. If you were a gentleman as you are not, I would already have punished your foolishness and audacity, unhappy creature. To which the Basque replied, not gentleman me, as Christian, I make vow to God, you lie. Throw away lance and put out sword and soon see which one make horse drink. Basque by land, noble by sea, noble by devil, if say other thing, you lie. <laughs> now you will see, said a, a gracious uh, replied, uh, uh, said a gracious replied Don Quixote. Um, that's a, that's a, a, an earlier character, uh, a romantic uh, character. After uh, chivalric character, after throwing his lance to the ground, he drew his sword, grasped his shield, and attacked the Basque, determined to take his life. The Basque, who saw him coming at him in this manner, wanted to get off the mule, which, being one of the inferior ones for hire, could not be trusted. But all he could do was draw his sword. It was his good fortune, however, to be next to the carriage, and he seized one of the pillows and used it as a shield. And the two of them went at each other as if they were mortal enemies. The rest of the people tried to make peace between them, but could not, because the Basque said in his tangled words that if they did not allow him to finish his fight, he himself would kill his mistress and everyone else who got in his way. The lady in the carriage, stunned and fearful at what she saw, had the coachman drive some distance away, and from there she watched the fierce contest, in the course of which the Basque went over Don Quixote's shield and struck a great blow with his sword to his shoulder, and if it had not been protected by armor, he would have opened it to the waist. Don Quixote, who felt the pain of that enormous blow, gave a great shout, saying, O lady of my soul, Dulcinea, flower of beauty, come to the aid of this thy knight, who, for thy sake of thy great virtue, finds himself in grave peril. Saying this, and grasping his sword, and protecting himself with his shield, and attacking the Basque, were all one, for he was determined to venture everything on the fortune of a single blow. It isn't really a good knight who calls on the lady to save him. <laughs> that's, that's just not done. 
Uh, but he does. Uh, Lady of my soul, he says. The Basque, seeing him attacked in this fashion, clearly understood the courage in this rash act and resolved to do the same as Don Quixote. And so he waited for him, shielded by his pillow and unable to turn the mule one way or the other, for the mule, utterly exhausted and not made for such foolishness, could not take another step. Um, the, this, is, this is glorious because there, you have at least one of them up on a mule, and the mule is a mule, so it's not really turning around too much. And they're, they're fighting with pillows, among other things. And it's just an absolutely ridiculous scene. As has been said, Don Quixote was charging the wary Basque with his sword on high, determined to cut him in half, and the Basque, well protected by his pillow, was waiting for him. His sword also raised, and all the onlookers were filled with fear and suspense regarding the outcome of the great blows they threatened to give each other. And the lady in the carriage and all her maids were making a thousand vows and offering to all the images and houses of devotion in Spain so that God would deliver the squire and themselves from the great danger in which they found themselves. But the difficulty in all this is that at this very point in juncture, the author of the history leaves the battle pending, apologizing because he found nothing else written about the feats of Don Quixote other than what he has already recounted. Now that's a novel, okay? The author is speaking to you, and the author is pretending that this account came from a written version of it. And he says, and it, it just broke off there. <laughs> now, this, is, this is delightful, because what you have is Don Quixote with his sword charging at this Basque, who's up on a stubborn mule, holding a pillow and his own sword. And mid-charge, <laughs> it's just like, it's like the movie ends. Like, to be continued. To be continued. <laughs> or like, you fill in the rest. <laughs> like, what do you think happened? Um, it is certainly true that the second author of this work did not want to believe that, oh, sorry, so curious a history would be subjected to the laws of oblivion, or that the great minds of La Mancha possessed so little interest that they did not have in their archives or writing tables a few pages that dealt with this famous knight. And so, with this thought in mind, he did not despair of finding the conclusion to this gentle history, which, with heaven's help, he discovered in the manner that will be revealed in part two. Now that's how you tell a good story, isn't it? Don't you want to know what happened? So go find out. It will be done. Is this um, the author's version of like a Dave Sex Machina, like in this version? Uh, yeah, kind of. Yeah, if we think of it more as the kind of modern sense of Dave Sex Machina, um, <laughs> the, the, uh, the author is like jumping in. Right. You know? But yeah, it's like, ah, you know, and then it's like, cut. And the author kind of walks up onto the screen and is like, um, so that's where it broke off, <laughs> and I'm doing a lot of work because I'm trying to figure out what's going on. Uh, have you ever seen a movie with a really prominent narrator, especially a humorous like, one? Like uh, Emperor's New Groove. Okay, The Emperor's New Groove, right? Yeah, <laughs> great movie. I'm wondering yeah, my like sons love that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah where Cusco is constantly coming in and like breaking yeah. in and talking, right? This guy would care about nothing. This guy. <laughs> this guy. Yeah, um, it's played for laughs, isn't it? Mm -hmm. um, you know, in, in ancient Greece, you'll, you'll see this in, in classes where we, we talk about ancient tragedies and, and comedies, but tragedies in particular, there are often, uh, you know, choruses that will come in and tell you about what's going on. This is, this is a novel because the author is breaking in and telling you as the author about the story. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Um, you don't really have that in something like Roland, do you? Uh, we have that name Taroldus at the end, who may have been the singer of one form of it. But it's not like Taraldus is constantly breaking in and saying, now the text actually broke off here because it seems like Roland and Oliver were about to bow to each other, but it stopped. So let's imagine he's not breaking in like that. And Cervantes does. So that's one of the many things that we can see that, that um, is a point where Cervantes is both traveling in that epic genre, he's undermining the epic genre, and he's also doing something that's fairly new. Final thoughts? Comments, humorous, humorous anecdotes. I just feel like I'm watching a three-year-old kid, <laughs> but so like, the, you know what I mean? Like, I just it's feel like I'm watching childish. my child. It's very he's childish. He's just 50 years old now. Like yeah. somehow he just goes, "Let's pick a kid," and all of his imagination, yeah. and all that a child will do, and then make him 50, yeah. and send him out in the world and see what would happen with the mind of a three-year-old, and it's entertaining. Like yeah. I just, I have flashes of my son yeah. using like cardboard boxes as cars and airplanes and all these things, and it's like, oh. Okay. I, I almost brought in and showed you all a picture of my, my son Jack, who for a period was obsessed with helmets. And there was a period where like, he went through his entire day with this old Roman style helmet just kind of strapped to his, to his head. 
I mean, it's all I think of when I when I think of you know Don Quixote with these straps, you know, tying his helmet to his head. Um, it's quite childish. It's very funny. Um, is there something pleasing about that, or is that just disturbing? Are you just like this guy is too old to be doing this? Um, I find it I find it very enjoyable. I think that there's something kind of life giving and grace filled about it. That he's he's not he's not living like a fifty year old. Um, he's not living like a you know, kind of mid-level landowner. He's, he's going crazy. Um, but it's causing a lot of problems for a lot of people. At least a few of you, I'm guessing, are practical enough that you're just like, you know, you take the view of somebody like my wife. My wife would read this and just be like, this is really dumb. Why is this guy doing this? Like, he's causing problems for people. <laughs> you know, he should have just stayed home. <laughs> um, so it, it's going to, in part, depend on your personality as to whether you see this as somebody who's creating property damage and loss for other people or you know, whether he's, he's entertaining. What do you think? What's that term for the comedic hero who's the little person? Who, like, always sees the good in things? Like, he's the main character. I forget what it's called. Like Frodo. I mean, uh, uh, Sam. No, not like Frodo, but basically, you know, he's the little Probably, guy. I, I would say, like, in something like Lord of the Rings, when we get to it, that it's, it's just a hero. Yeah. He's a hero. Yeah, but there's, like, a, um, I think I took, yeah. Kind of a, character. like, a, a, an unexpected hero or yeah. a, Underestimated hero. Yeah. He feels like a Pink Panther almost. Like somehow accomplishes mm -hmm. the job, but as a buffoon in the process. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a good, that's a good analogy actually. Do you get the Pink Panther or someone like that? Where does he actually accomplish the job? <laughs> I don't think he's doing anything like value added to the world. <laughs> Depends what the job is. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he's not adding value to the world, but he made you laugh. He got minus. Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, yes. we'll we'll carry on. Uh, let's, let's pause there. Uh, we'll carry <laughs> it on. This seems to be the one that, that got your attention the most, both good and bad. It seems like you guys have strong opinions on it either way. It's, it's entertaining. Fun. I mean, it, it is entertaining. If that it, was the purpose, he's done a great job. It does just so much remind me of both of my sons at points. Where it's like the funny part is it's like the...
as to where I have it related. Too much reflected on what I've been reading. Yep. But this this is all very new to me, and I'm, I normally read just simple prose, you know, self help books or something yeah. like that. Is you read a lot of theology too, right? Yeah. And I'm kind of sure it's been reading a lot of it. Of course. So I know you appreciate some comments about this yeah. class. Uh -huh. But oh, yes. uh -huh. this is a criterion. Oh, awesome. I just had it yesterday. There's a flash sale for criterion. 50% huh. huh. off. No kidding. Um, I love this movie. Yeah. And like, it comes in like really nicely. Oh, um, awesome. Terrence and I like, criterion approach him. He's like, do you want to make an extended edition? Hmm. So like last year, hmm. he just re-edited the whole thing. No kidding. No kidding. I didn't so, know that. Yeah, so there's now an extended edition. That's they like awesome. went back to the warehouse when it had a bunch of footage. Because it's, it's like boxes and boxes of film. Wow. So he like took it and then re-edited it. Extended. They, and then they re-released it? Did they put it in theaters when it came out like that? No. Oh. It literally came out October of last year. Wow. wow. Um, and Criterion just made the special edition for them. <laughs> so I'm really excited to see it. I haven't seen it. I have to let you know what you think of it. I, I remember seeing the movie when it came out in theaters and just being blown away. We're talking about Terrence Malick's Tree of Life. Have you guys seen, anybody seen that movie? Why do they hate it? Because it's not very uh, plot, it's it's not very plot driven. <laughs> well, yeah, they're not used to that, first of all, but I mean, there's, there's plenty of plot. And the thing is that it starts with the first 50 minutes, so the first class period they watch it, there's that whole creation scene, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. like 30 minutes of what people have labeled as screensavers. Hmm. So it does feel a little bit like a screensaver, yeah. That's yeah. Great. So like they were like <laughs> and, and they it, they get lost at first a little oh. bit in the dinosaurs and all that. Have you guys seen it? Yeah. Yeah. It's really good. Yeah. Uh, Terrence Malick is one of those filmmakers who's really influenced by theological themes. Mm. I don't know if he would consider himself a Christian, you know? I think he was a monk at some point. Oh. <laughs> I'm not okay. like I think because he was crazy. like one of the uh, he, he made a lot of movies in the 60s, um, like Days of Heaven and Badlands, and mm -hmm. then there was just like this 30, 40 year gap where like he just yeah. disappeared. Yeah. He moved to Europe, and uh -huh. he was in France and Germany, and I think he went, might have gone to seminary actually, I don't know. Hmm. But he's he's not like a conventional Christian, for yeah. sure. He's a bit aloof too, isn't he? He's not somebody who would like give a ton of interviews about his life. Yeah, no, he's very private. Yeah. Uh, which is like also this has, uh, so this is approved by him. This whole thing and it has like a bunch of essays and uh, documentaries that he was like, this is good to go. So I, I love what that has in there. I may borrow that when you're, when you're done. With oh, that. I, I will. <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna show it to Sunday first because she <laughs> she hasn't even seen it. So I'm gonna watch. The film again with her, just the normal one, and then an extended edition by myself, unless she wants to join me. I guess. The extended edition might be tough for the first, <laughs> the first go. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like it's it's like three and a half hours. Yeah. So it's like. Hey. All right. So are you ready, Doug? Mm -hmm. Ready when you are. No yeah, hurry. We're, we're still good. waiting for Scott. So. Good. Okay. Um, so uh, on to Moby Dick, or the Whale. <laughs> um, what did you think of this work? Getting, we're getting towards the end of our, our epics. So we've now traveled into the 19th century. So we think of our progression, you know, we're, we read uh, the Iliad, which is written probably towards the end of the, the 8th century BC, right? So we now have a range from roughly 1,000 years before Christ. Just getting going, come on in, no worries. Uh, so we've got a range, you know, from about a thousand years before Christ in terms of events and stories, uh, all the way up to now the middle of the 19th century. Uh, this work was written around the year 1850, 1851, uh, by Herman Melville. Um, it is often described as the great American novel. Uh, some would disagree, and um, uh, they might identify one or two other works as the great American novel. Any ideas what other works might compete with Melville's Moby Dick, at least nowadays in terms of that question? It's a subjective question, of course. Scarlet Letter, maybe? The Scarlet Letter might be, uh, might be some, uh, a work that would compete with it, perhaps. Nathaniel Hawthorne, did you see that? Uh, to his friend, uh, Nathaniel Hawthorne. Um, just looking to see if I can find the, the page to point it out to you. Give me a moment. Uh, yeah, so 
uh, right after uh, the front page, which is re reproduced for you from 1851, you look right past that. Uh, in token of my admiration for his genius, this book is inscribed to Nathaniel Hawthorne. Uh, it's right before the etymology. <laughs> etymology is great. <laughs> the origin of the word whale, or other words for whale. <laughs> my younger sister, who is an attorney and very, very well read herself in the classics, um, recently was reading through Moby Dick. So I got very excited because I knew I was going to be teaching on it. So I was like, you know, what, what, what did you think of Moby Dick? She said, there's a lot about whaling. <laughs> it's like, there comes a point where you have just learned too much about what the whaling industry. <laughs> I'm like, well, that's a fair point. <laughs> um, so, yeah, right before the etymology there, we have the dedication to Nathaniel Hawthorne. So perhaps Scarlet Letter might be uh, a contender. Uh, the other work that often gets mentioned is F. Scott Fitzgerald's The Great Gatsby, which is also a remarkable uh, fictional novel uh, from much later, uh, from the, the 1920s, uh, but a, a remarkable work as well. Um, but I, I picked Moby Dick um, uh, because I wanted to kind of carry on with a tradition in this, this class, which is I wanted the, the works to pass the stupid test. And I mentioned this on the, the first day, I think, that I didn't want to assign works where you had to really think hard as to why this particular work might be an epic. You know, why would this book of all books be included in a class on epic? Um, you know from reading the assigned sections, this is an epic, right? It just kind of jumps out at you. It has a lot of the characteristics of an epic. Um, and so uh, um, I'm curious, before I, I start giving you my thoughts on this, this book, what your initial reactions to it were. It seems like you're all comfortable with the idea that this was an epic. We'll see some of those themes, but just personal feedback on it. Was it an enjoyable read? Was it tedious? What did you think? What do you think, Jose? This could almost play as a short story. I okay. Think. Yeah. And then it's like... Yeah. Uh, I don't, it's, <laughs> it's so big. Like, um, like you took a short story and then, and then crammed a large epic into it. <laughs> yeah. Or yeah. expanded it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it just seems like the narrative and again, I, I actually had a tougher time reading. I don't know if it was because I was actually in a retreat while I was reading it. So I was reading it and then telling kids to shut up at the same time. <laughs> and like being annoyed by the music mm -hmm. and that. And it was mm -hmm. like maybe a lot. But <clears throat> it just, I enjoyed the first part. Yeah. Um, the first 31 chapters. Or yeah. Uh -huh. uh, and then it kind of, it was a little bit tough for me to pick up later on mm -hmm. you know like oh what what's happened so far but yeah. then i finished it and i was like did that much happen in the middle of that huge section that we even have to read yes and no <laughs> right. um um yeah I mean, yeah it, it, it's a criticism sometimes it can be lodged against sermons you know that a pastor has five minutes of material but he's got an hour to fill you know <laughs> you gotta stretch out that five minutes of material um and one, one criticism that could be leveled against Melville is that this was a, a cute little story about going on a whaling ship uh, that turned into a vast epic. Um, you know, it's, it's almost as if he became the captive of his pen and couldn't stop himself. Uh, now, we need to say a little bit about Melville. Melville did, in fact, have experience uh, sailing on a whaling ship. Uh, he had uh, himself, before this, written several novels that were fairly popular about some of his travels. Uh, novels where he would talk about, uh, say, being on an island uh, near Tahiti uh, in the Pacific and the kinds of, and I'm putting this very, very explicitly in quotation marks, but the kinds of savages he encountered. Uh, and people at that time were really fascinated by that kind of thing. Cannibalism, native cultures, those kinds of things. Um, he played fast and loose. Uh, with the truth when it came to recounting what had happened to him and people weren't always aware of just how much he was actually making up certain stories. Um, but he was a pretty popular author until he wrote Moby Dick. Uh, Moby Dick was a flop. Uh, it was not well received. Um, there's one reference, and I believe it's in the introduction to this, so you can find it yourself, but one of the early uh, pieces of feedback uh, came from, I want to say it was a Boston Globe or a Boston newspaper, it said something like, it's not worth the reader's time and it's not worth the paper it's written on, that kind of thing. That's paraphrasing, but that was kind of the, the general uh, uh, reception at the time. So here he is, a pretty popular travel author, 
talking about his voyages and all those kind of things. Then he sets out to write Moby Dick. He publishes it, and it's not well received. Um, it isn't until much later, well, until the well into the 20th century, that um, literary critics and just readers start to recognize its greatness as an American epic. It's sometimes called the democratic epic. Um, and you can, you can imagine why that is. Um, this is a, a novel which is um, and an epic which uh, has American characters in the middle of the 19th century. Um, what's going on around the year 1850 when this is published? I mean, think in broad strokes. What kind of things are happening in American history? Post-Civil War where finally things have finally got on track and you got the the uh, Rockefellers and the great expansion. Yeah, it's actually, it's pre-Civil War. So Civil War is, so it yeah, may not have been clear. War. Yeah, may not have been clear. So uh, 1850 is 11 years before the Civil War. Yeah. Um, so Civil War is 1861 to 1865. This is 1850. Uh, what is happening at that time is that there is an effort to actually keep the Union together. Um, and it's an effort that's being made by politicians in the North and the South. This, of course, isn't a history class. You, you, you had these kinds of uh, discussions, I'm sure, in like American history classes and things like that. But in essence, uh, the country is expanding. There is a belief in what's called manifest destiny, that it is the destiny of uh, Americans to travel west, to settle those areas, to often ruthlessly dispossess the Indians of that territory. Um, you think of the kind of bitter line in the movie Maver Maverick about the Indians being on our land before we got here. That's kind of the, the attitude. So there's this move west to, um, to uh, dispossess the Indians of that land and to settle it ourselves. Um, along with that comes a great deal of very, very uh, bitter controversy over the issue of slavery. Because the way that the, the system had kind of existed in a precarious way for you know, the period since the founding of our country, was that southern states were predominantly safe slave states, northern states were predominantly free states. Uh, as there was expansion and as there were, there were more and more states being added to the Union, the question always becomes, this new state, is it going to be a slave or a free state? And there was a concern on both sides that the balance of power would shift one way or the other. So this is a period in which there's a great deal of concern that the Union itself is going to break apart that this democratic experiment in the United States is going to fail. Um, there is a, a famous uh, analogy uh, that comes from Plato, and it was probably used before Plato, to what's called the ship of state. Perhaps you've heard this, that uh, uh, in ancient political discourse, it was common to refer to a state or a city as a ship. And the question is, is the captain the right kind of captain for the ship, or the crew, kind of all on the same page, and you can, you can think of that kind of as an allegory for political philosophy in the ancient world. Uh, it's possible that Melville is picking up on that, and that he's writing something like an allegory for his time. It would be wrong to overread Melville's allegory, all right? So as we're going along, don't try to, to pick, you know, figure out exactly which politician Queequeg <laughs> represents or stub. <laughs> I mean, they don't, they probably don't pre precisely uh, uh, reflect a particular movement or a particular politician. But if you want to think of it broadly as an allegory, the, the idea of the ship of state that is, is uh, being driven off course, that is probably the kind of thing that Melville had in his head. You kind of made this comment earlier, Sam, in terms of uh, uh, interpreting texts like this, that it's important to try to think what the author was, had in his mind. We don't know for sure, but it's likely that Melville, writing at this time, is situating his novel uh, in that political discourse, if that makes sense. The country is, is on the brink of catastrophe, and he presents the, the story of a ship, a whaling ship, uh, that itself is, is um, sailing into danger. Again, don't overread it. Don't, don't try to find a comparison between John C. Calhoun and Queequeg or something like that. They're not, they're not probably gonna match up perfectly, uh, but that, that is likely what Melville is doing here. Um, we talked a lot when we, when we talked about earlier epics, ancient epics, um, about how much you can have multiple layers of meaning in a good epic. So 
think of the, the story that we, we encountered of, of Hector uh, reaching for his son and his son recoils at the, the horsehair helmet. And you could say, and we talked about this, that this is a boy who's scared of a scary helmet. You could say that this is a boy who is smart enough to know that a giant horsehair thing is scary, unlike the Trojans who bring the horse in later. I mean, you can, you can build multiple layers of meaning onto it and never quite get beyond the visceral uh, uh, sense that this is a scene that's happened millions of times. A father is about to go to war and he goes and he picks up his son and his son is scared of the helmet. <laughs> um, Moby Dick is a bit like that in that you can interpret it to mean a lot of things, but its strength is in the fact that Melville luxuriates in words. Um, when I think of, of Melville and Moby Dick, I think of, uh, of a guy in a spa, you know, after a long day, uh, just kind of like relaxing. And the words are the water. <laughs> he, he is enjoying uh, the English language in this work, as we'll see in a number of places. Um, think, of, think of the scene with uh, Queequeg at the table in the, the tavern, uh, grabbing the beef steaks with his harpoon, and the shock of everyone that this savage is eating them. Um, and the descriptions are just very rich and very full-bodied. Um, so part of the reason why many, many people have, have come to love Moby Dick, as I have, is not just because it's such a powerful political allegory. It probably does have some political meaning to it, but it's because it's such an enjoyable read. It's just uh, a master of the English language uh, at his finest. Um, I, I used to see this uh, when I was practicing law, that you know, Florida has correct me here, Jim, if I'm wrong, but I, I think the last time I checked, something like 80,000 lawyers. I mean, something like that. It's an astronomically high number. And when you practice law, you interact with countless lawyers, many of whom are just awful. You know, they, they just don't know what they're doing, believe it or not. You, you think that they should know. They went to law school. They practice. A lot of times, they're just terrible. But you come up against somebody who's really good at their craft. I mean, somebody who's practiced for many, many years and just honed their craft. And there's a sense in which you, you see their uh, style of, say, litigation or, or legal practice, uh, almost like if you think of a mathematical equation that's solved well, and they call it an elegant solution. It's not just getting to the right answer, but it's getting there the right way, in a beautiful way. Lawyers can do that. Uh, a really skilled lawyer can solve a problem or handle a case in a way that looks elegant. Melville is like this with the English language. It's not just what he sang, but the way he gets there is just really gripping. And if you love words, you love Melville, because he loved words and he used them really well. Um, let's look at um, Moby Dick together. Before we do that, does anyone have anything to, to comment just personally about that as far as how you encountered this? Yeah. yeah I've been reading a lot of Robert Alter, who's a Jewish oh, yeah, scholar yeah, that does yeah. a lot of literary stuff, uh -huh. and um, for the Old Testament in particular. It's really good stuff. Um, he had a book called The Pen of Iron, mm -hmm. I think it's called, about how I knew it. the King James Version has influenced the language of yeah. America versus yeah. England. Yeah. And he uses Melville. And the way that you describe Melville, I was like, I gotta read this book. Yeah. So yeah. I started reading it before this class even was offered. And so, uh, yeah, I, I really appreciate his language and how it just reflects the King James. Mm -hmm. So just so everyone's on the same page, just that, that recommendation <laughs> I think is a really good one. So there's, a, there's an Old Testament scholar, a Jewish scholar who's been a professor of comparative literature for many years now. He's in his, I want to say mid-80s at this point, is that right? Uh, his name is Robert Alter, wonderful literary scholar of, of the Old Testament. But he has this wonderful book called Pen of Iron, right? And it's about the King James's influence on American literature. And he talks about Melville in particular. So if you're, if you're interested, if you go from this class and you want to read more um, about uh, biblical language in Melville, especially Old Testament language, go to that book. There's some, there's some really fascinating stuff in that. Thank you for that, that's really helpful. It's cool that you were reading it before this, this yeah, class even. Yeah. Um, anybody else read Moby Dick before this class? So this is the first time, yeah. did you? Yeah. You're, you're, Do you remember how it struck you at the time? Do what? Do you remember how it struck you at the time? Did you enjoy it when you read it? Um, yes and no, it was a... Um, <clears throat> kind of an overwhelming thing. Mm -hmm. But I tend to think in terms uh, as a generalist mm -hmm. as opposed to a specialist. Yeah. I mean, even in professionally as a lawyer, yeah. I always 
was a generalist mm -hmm. as opposed to a specialist. Yep. Yep. And so <clears throat> that sort of allowed me to get past the nitty gritty and, yep. and see the big and try to see a big picture. Huh. I guess that huh. uh -huh. would be uh -huh. and you can see particularly that. the conclusion that mm -hmm. that kind of wraps up in a in a in a beautiful way. Mm -hmm. We will see the conclusion. The conclusion is going to be an epic conclusion, <laughs> um, like so many of them have been. Um, yeah. I just think it's interesting coming from like the Iliad or the Aeneid, where yeah. it, it's so far away. You don't. I don't personally feel the, the craziness of the revenge that is being sought out. Uh huh. Whereas with this one, it just seems far more closer to home. Interesting. Okay. And so it yeah. just seems like this is more relatable on some level for him. This man's just mm -hmm. out of his mind, and I feel bad yeah. for the people that are with him. Yeah. Don Quixote, it's just entertaining. You're just yeah. along for the ride. Yeah. It's just kind of funny. But with this one, you begin to think, man, this guy's lost it. Yeah, Don Quixote is gentler. Don Quixote is probably the work in all of these that we've given the shortest shrift to. Um, in that, you know, we, had, we didn't travel through the whole work because it would take us three of these classes to do that. Um, but there's a, there's a savagery to this madness. Uh, you know, the, the madness of Don Quixote, if he's mad, is, is a gentle kind of madness that hurts him. It hurts some other people sometimes, but it hurts him. But it, it, it kind of flows along at a nice little pace, where the madness of Ahab is crazy. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's a reference, and we'll see if we have time to get to it in this, that, that uh, the narrator tells us you know, that, that if the owners of the ship uh, and the investors in the voyage had known what Ahab was really doing. There's no way that they would have supported it. <laughs> they don't know that this guy's crazy like this. Um, so there's a there's a, a savagery to his insanity that's really gripping. Um, we also have a monster, don't we? <laughs> the question, of course, that people are asking uh, and have been asking for quite some time is, who's the monster? <laughs> is it the whale? Is it Ahab? Right. Yeah. Um, so let's uh, let's dive into chapter one. And we'll see how far we can get uh, before lunch. Um, most famous uh, uh, opening uh, statement, maybe in all of English literature, for the opening of a book. You all know it. Call me Ishmael. Some years ago, never mind how long precisely, having little or no money in my purse and nothing particular to interest me on shore, I thought I would sail about a little and see the watery part of the world. It is a way I have of driving off the spleen and regulating the circulation. Whenever I find myself growing grim about the mouth, whenever it is a damp, drizzly November in my soul, whenever I find myself involuntarily pausing before coffin warehouses and bringing up the rear of every funeral I meet, and especially whenever my hypos get such an upper hand of me that it requires a strong moral principle to prevent me from deliberately stepping into the street and methodically knocking people's hats off. Then I count it high time to get to sea as soon as I can. This is my substitute for pistol and ball. With a philosophical flourish, Cato throws himself upon his sword. I quietly take to ship. And your, your narrator, Ishmael, here is uh, telling you that he goes to sea to stave off what? Killing himself. Yeah, yeah, the depression that leads to suicide, essentially. There is nothing surprising in this. If they but knew it, almost all men in their degree, some time or other, cherish very nearly the same feelings towards the ocean with me. Uh, I have to tell you personally, there is something quite invigorating about being on the ocean. I don't know how, how many of you have been out on boats? I mean, growing up in South Florida, I've been quite a few times, and there's something that just kind of reinvigorates you when you're out there. Um, there's something about living in a place like Scotland that by November, when it's dark all the time, is a bit, uh, shall we say, uninvigorating. <laughs> it's depressing. Um, my first year in Scotland, uh, when January came along, I was used to, you know, South Florida when, you know, maybe you've had a little coldness in December, but now it's January, everything's going to warm up. And it took me a while to realize that, no, we had four more months of cold, dark, damp weather. Um, and it's a depressing thing on your mood. So Ishmael uh, introduces himself to his reader and says, if you want to stave off the depression that leads to suicide, uh, go to sea, like me. Page five, uh, halfway down. Now when I say that I am in the habit of going to sea whenever I begin to grow hazy about the eyes and begin to be overconscious of my lungs, I do not mean to have it inferred that I ever go to sea as a passenger. 
For to go as a passenger, you must needs have a purse. And a purse is but a rag unless you have something in it. Isn't that a great turn of phrase? Uh, besides, passengers get seasick, grow quarrelsome, don't sleep of nights, do not enjoy themselves much as a general thing. No, I never go as a passenger, nor, though I am something of a salt, do I ever go to sea as a commodore or a captain or a cook. I abandon the glory and distinction of such offices to those who like them. For my part, I abominate all honorable, respectable toils, trials, and tribulations of every kind whatsoever. It is quite as much as I can do to take care of myself with ta without taking care of ships, barks, brigs, schooners, and whatnot. And as for going as a cook, though I confess there is considerable glory in that, the cook being a sort of officer on shipboard, yet somehow I never fancied broiling fowls. Though once broiled, judiciously buttered, and judgmatically salted, and peppered. There is no one who will speak more reflect, reflect, uh, respectfully, not to say reverentially, of a broiled fowl than I will. It is out of the idolatrous doting of the old Egyptians upon broiled ibis and roasted river horse that you see the mummies of those creatures in their huge bakehouses, the pyramids. No, when I go to sea, I go as a simple sailor, right before the mast, plumb down into the forecastle, aloft to where the royal masthead, uh, aloft there to the royal masthead. True, they rather order me about some, and make me jump from spar to spar like a grasshopper in a main meadow. And at first, this sort of thing is unpleasant enough. It touches one's sense of honor, particularly if you come with an old established family in the land, and then he lists some of those families. More than all, if just previously to putting your hand into the tar pot, you have been lording it as a country schoolmaster, making the tallest boys stand in awe of you. The transition is a keen one, I assure you, from a schoolmaster to a sailor, and requires a strong decoction of Seneca and the Stoics to enable you to grin and bear it. But even this wears off in time. Now, I read you that whole passage because I want to comment on a few things that are, that are uh, uh, interesting here and they kind of tie into this being an epic. One is that these, these are very long and very ornate sentences. Do you notice that? Like I kind of have to like take large breaths in between uh, with commas and semicolons and uh, hyphens and so on. Um, it's, it's uh, highly, highly ornate on passages even like, uh, I never fancy, fancy broiling fowls. And then he goes on to talk about how good a fowl is when it's broiled the right way and buttered properly. Um, this is, this is uh, one aspect of something that could be an epic, which is not quite the simile, but the very ornate description of things. Okay? And he does have a simile in this passage we read, uh, which is, True, they rather order me about some and make me jump from spar to spar like a grasshopper in a May meadow. So he's, he's carrying on this kind of tradition of, of epic simile by describing uh, things very ornately and uh, giving us very vivid um, uh, similes to, to give us word pictures. Um, bottom of that page, again, I always go to sea as a sailor because they make a point of paying me for my trouble. Whereas they never pay passengers a single penny that I ever heard of. On the contrary, passengers themselves must pay. And here is all the difference in the world between paying and being paid. Um, next page. So I cannot tell why it was exactly that those stage managers, the fates. Hmm, there they are. Okay, so it's epic, right? So I cannot tell why it was exactly that those stage managers, the fates, put me down for the shabby part of a whaling voyage, when others were set down for magnificent parts in high tragedies, and short and easy parts in genteel comedies, and jo jolly parts in farces. Though I cannot tell why this was exactly, yet now I recall all the circumstances. I think I can see a little into the springs and motives which being cunningly presented to me under various disguises induced me to set about performing the part I did besides cajoling me into the delusion that it was a choice resulting from my own unbiased free will and discriminating judgment. Now, by the way, that was one sentence. <laughs> that was a long sentence. But do you see the face? Okay. Yeah. Do you see the sense that he, he feels himself um, driven by uh, fate? Um, chief among these motives was the overwhelming idea of the great whale himself. Such a portentous and mysterious monster roused all my curiosity. This is epic, okay? We're going to have a monster. We have to have a monster or something like that that drives the plot for us. So it's not just gonna be an evil bad guy. It's not gonna be the forces of evil out there. It's going to be a monster. Um, again, one of the questions will always be for people reading uh, um, 
Melville is, um, is the monster, the whale, or is it Ahab? Okay. Um, he goes into an, an inn in chapter 3 on the seaside, uh, getting ready to uh, join a, a whaling ship. Um, and I want to um, just comment on something and then pass over it. We don't have time to address it, but there on uh, page 13 and 14, you'll see that he, he sees a painting at the, in the entrance of the inn that is blurry, and it's very descriptive, and he, he seems to see what, what he takes to be a giant whale in the painting. It's almost like there's a hurricane that's come up that's blowing the ship astray, and there's what he thinks is possibly a whale in the painting. It's foreshadowing the ending. Does that make sense? We're going to end with a whale. What's the whale going to do? <laughs> it's going to destroy the ship. Um, and he's, he's seeing this image of doom, he thinks. Uh, but he's not dis dissuaded from going on this voyage. Um, and uh, he asks for a room and is told that if he gets a room, he's going to have to have a bed mate. Okay? Uh, this would be common at this time um, for, for people who are sharing a room to share a bed. Uh, but he gets a premonition about uh, the bedmate because he's told that his bedmate um, has been out uh, selling his head in the town. Now this is a, a really delightful wordplay on Melville's part because what he presents the, the character Ishmael as understanding that to be is selling his head when in fact the man is selling a head that he owns. Okay? He's from uh, New Zealand and or off the coast of New Zealand, and he is a cannibal, a Queequeg, who we're going to meet. Okay, so he's out selling one of his shrunken heads. Um, how did that strike you? It's, it's a bit jarring, isn't Sorry. it? Yeah. Um, what is this? What is the use of that? Uh, like, why is he selling a head? Uh, to make money. What did they use the head for? <laughs> Probably like as a souvenir. Okay. Yeah. Um, That's weird. I don't know how common that was at this time, yeah. but you know, it'd be a, a kind of weird thing to have in your, your foyer, you know? <laughs> Welcome, <laughs> our head, <laughs> you know? <laughs> got some nice paintings back there. We've got the head out here. Um, uh, so uh, let's, let's uh, meet uh, Queequeg, um, his, his bedmate. Um, bottom of page 22. Um, he, uh, Ishmael has gone to bed and Queequeg is going to come in in the middle of the night uh, at the very bottom of the page Lord save me thinks I that must be the harpooner uh, the infernal head peddler but I lay perfectly still and re not, resolved not to say a word till spoken to holding a light in one hand and that identical New Zealand head in the other the stranger entered the room and without looking towards the bed placed his candle a good way off from me on the floor in one corner and then began working away at the knotted cords of the large bag I before spoke of as being in the room. I was all eagerness to see his face, but he kept it averted for some time while employed in unlacing the bag's mouth. This accomplished, however, he turned round when, good heavens, what a sight! Such a face! It was of a dark purplish yellow color, here and there stuck over with large blackish looking squares. Yes, it's just as I thought, he's a terrible bedfellow. He's been in a fight, got dreadfully cut, and here he is, just from the surgeon. But at that moment, he chanced to turn his face so towards the light that I plainly saw they could not be sticking plasters at all, those black squares on his cheeks. They were stained of some sort or other. At first, I knew not what to make of this, but soon an inkling of the truth occurred to me. I remembered a story of a white man, a whale man too, who, falling among the cannibals, had been tattooed by them. I concluded that this harpooner in the course of, this distant, of his distant voyages must have met with a similar adventure. Skipping down towards the, the bottom, about ten lines up. But after some difficulty, having opened his bag, he commenced fumbling in it and presently pulled out a sort of tomahawk and a sealskin wallet with the hair on it. Placing these on the old chest in the middle of the room, he then took the New Zealand head, a ghastly thing enough, and crammed it down into the bag. He now took off his hat, a new beaver hat, when I came nigh singing out with fresh surprise. There was no hair on his head, none to speak of it at least, nothing but a small scalp knot twisted up on his forehead. His bald, purplish head now looked for all the world like a mildewed skull. Had not the stranger stood between me and the door, I would have bolted out of it quicker than ever. I bolted a dinner. Um, now, what is, what is going on with this description of Queequeg? 
He's very exotic, isn't he? Yeah. He, he doesn't look at all like, like Ishmael. But whatever we imagine Ishmael looking like, we quite doesn't look like him. Um, yeah. And he's playing with you right now. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of like, oh, I know who this guy is. No, I don't know who <laughs> yeah. this guy is. And yeah. then as soon as you think he's, oh, he's this savage yeah. who's got all these crazy rituals and mm -hmm. he's probably not a very nice person, you mm -hmm. find out that he's actually less of a savage than Ishmael yeah. might, we might say. Um, Moby Dick is, a, is all about monsters, as we said, and what we're meeting is a monster who's not a monster. Mm -hmm. uh, he appears at first glance to be. Uh, Ishmael is convinced that this Queequeg is actually going to kill him in his bed. Um, there's some really delightful scenes, a number of which we're, we're going to skip over, um, where he's, he's convinced that Queequeg is going to kill him. Uh, but he learns over time that Queequeg is not a monster. Um, and that, that's a really interesting twist. He's setting it up so that you can uh, kind of follow uh, Ishmael in his, his realization that this is this you know, serial killer type person who's now going to share a bed with him. But it turns out that this guy is not the monster of the, the work. Um, uh, he, is a, he is a pagan. Queequeg is a pagan. Um, and we see at the bottom of page 24 that he worships a pagan idol. Um, uh, if you see at the bottom, I concluded that it must be nothing but a wooden idol, which indeed it proved to be. For now the savage goes up to the empty fireplace and removing the papered fireboard, sets up this, this little hunchbacked image like a ten pin between the andirons. The chimney jams and all the bricks inside were very sooty, so that I thought that this fireplace made a very appropriate little shrine or chapel, chapel for this Congo idol. Um, and so he sees that Queequeg um, uh, worships or, or does uh, off, make, makes offerings uh, to this idol. Um, he uh, shrieks and tries to get out of the room. <laughs> and initially, Queequeg is, it, it would seem, more scared than he is. Uh, but they begin, they begin to speak, um, and uh, they, they uh, kind of uh, get along. The landlord comes in and uh, explains things a little bit. And at the bottom of, of uh, page 26, uh, Ishmael says, Landlord, said I, tell him to stash his tomahawk there or pipe or whatever you call it. Tell him to stop smoking, in short, and I will turn in with him. But I don't fancy having a man smoking in bed with me. It's dangerous. Besides, I ain't insured. It's a funny lawyer joke. I did insurance defense for a long time, so I chuckled when I read that. Um, Queequeg has a tomahawk that doubles as a, a giant pipe. Okay? He puts his tobacco in it and smokes out of it. Um, and Ishmael says, you gotta, can't smoke in bed. Uh, the bed will catch on fire and I'm not insured. Um, this being told to Queequeg, he at once complied and again politely motioned me to get into bed, rolling over to one side as much as to say, I won't touch a leg of ye. Good night, landlord, said I, you may go. I turned in and never slept better in my life. <laughs> I wouldn't have slept very well. <laughs> Upon waking next morning about daylight, next page, I found Queequeg's arm thrown over me in the most loving and affectionate manner. You had almost thought I had been his wife. Okay? So they're, they're getting to know each other. This is not gay, for what it's worth. I mean, you, can, you could try to read that into it, but Melville isn't writing about that. Um, uh, Page 31, um, there's, there's kind of an interesting uh, um, reference here to something that is startling to Ishmael, um, which is that when they do their, their kind of morning constitutional, Queequeg doesn't wash his face. So um, 31, middle of the second paragraph, he complied and then proceeded to wash himself. At that time in the morning, any Christian would have washed his face, but Queequeg, to my amazement, contented himself with restricting his ablutions to his chest, arms, and hands. He then donned his waistcoat and taking up a piece of hard soap on the washstand center table, dipped it into water, and commenced lathering his face. I was watching to see where he kept his razor, when lo and behold, he takes the harpoon from the bed corner, slips out the long wooden stock, unsheaths the head, wets it a little on his boot, and striding up to the bit of the mirror against the wall, begins a vigorous scraping or rather harpooning of his cheeks. Thanks I, Queequeg, this is using Roger's best cutlery with a vengeance. <laughs> That's a razor joke of some kind. You know, Roger's is probably like Gillette or something like that. I mean, it's, it's, this, is, this is great. Um, are you getting the, the foreignness and the oddity and, and you know, 
for lack of a better word, the savagery that, that uh, Ishmael is initially turned off by and scared by, but as he learns more about him, and as he learns more about this man, he becomes more comfortable with him, and his, his terror turns into interest. And um, uh, I think you, you, that's, that's one theme in this, in this novel, which is that um, Ishmael has gone to sea for an adventure, and he has to, in order to have the right kind of adventure, he has to lose some of those prejudices that he had. Does that make sense? So he has to, to see Queequeg as a friend, uh, even though Queequeg is so very different from him. Um, page 34, uh, I mentioned this about the beefsteaks. Um, uh, at the very bottom of the page, there, he's talking about their breakfast. We will not speak of all of Queequeg's peculiarities here, how he stewed coffee and hot rolls and applied his undivided attention to beefsteaks done rare. Enough that when breakfast was over, he withdrew like the rest into the public room, lighted his tomahawk, and was sitting there quietly digesting and smoking with his inseparable hat on when I sallied out for a stroll. So Queequeg, as we said, uh, loves the beefsteaks, and earlier in that passage, we're told he actually grabs them with his harpoon. He harpoons them. We're not going to talk about it in the class, but I'll point your attention to chapter 9, uh, which describes a sermon on the book of Jonah. I mean, that, that is a really critical uh, uh, motif for Melville, and I think you mentioned the, the um, Robert Alter book about the Old Testament. So the, the, um, the psalm that talks about they who go down to the sea in ships, right? We'll see these wonders that the Lord has created. I'm paraphrasing it. Uh, don't, don't rattle me to the psalmist. But um, this, is, this is an Old Testament theme that those who go down to the sea in ships are going to see monsters. And there's a sermon about the book of Jonah um, that Ishmael hears before he joins up. Um, let's uh, 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 skip forward a bit. Um, chapter 12 uh, gives us a bit of a biography of Queequeg. Um, he was the son of a, a minor prince of some kind on an island, uh, but he wanted adventures himself. And so he actually joins a ship and won't let them throw him off. He swims out to the ship, he's on a, I think a small canoe, right? He goes out to the ship, jumps up onto the ship and won't let them throw him off. Um, do you see the pairing of Ishmael and Queequeg that's being established? That Ishmael initially sees Queequeg as this awful serial killer who's coming to his room with a tomahawk to kill him. And as he learns more about him, he realizes, oh, you've actually gone to sea for adventure too. So the two of them are much more similar than you would have thought. Um, do what you will with all of that in terms of uh, the lessons to be drawn from that. Um, I'm sure that there's, there's plenty that could be, could be um, taken from that. Um, let's meet the ship. Um, what's the name of the ship? Anybody it remember? It's got Pequod. a kind of cool name. Pequod. Uh, what's the Pequod? What is the, what is the word Pequod? It's the name of a, a Indian, excuse me, an Indian tribe in Massachusetts that was exterminated by the Puritans. So the early Puritan settlers in the New World, uh, as part of their uh, attempt to establish their own settlements, uh, wiped out this small Indian tribe. Uh, is there significance in that? Probably. <laughs> okay. Think about uh, um, trying to think of a, of a good uh, extinct animal. If you you named your car the snow leopard <laughs> or something like that, uh, it probably wouldn't bode well for that car, would it? There were what, like six of the snow leopard left in the entire world. Uh, naming, naming something after an extinct uh, group or, or animal isn't boding well for it. So you see that kind of implicit imp prophecy in the name. It said that names are often important. Beowulf's name is important. Hector of the flashing helmet. The ship gets a name that predicts its future. I won't overread it, but do you get the point? Okay. Um, so whoever, whoever gave the name of the ship probably should have uh, thought more about that, although for the purpose of the story, it's a, it's a great, it's a great um, twist. Um, let's hear the first description of, of Ahab that we'll get uh, on page 80. Um, 
Captain Peleg, somebody who knows Ahab. On page 8, he describes him in the middle of the page. Clap eye on Captain Ahab, young man, and thou wilt find that he has only one leg. What do you mean, sir? Was the other one lost by a whale? Lost by a whale, young man, come nearer to me. It was devoured, chewed up, crunched by the monstrousest parmesity that ever chipped a boat. <laughs> great, great word. Monstrous est. <laughs> uh, that's a, that's a, a wonderful superlative there, right? Uh, ever chipped a boat. Ah, ah, I was a little alarmed by his energy, perhaps also a little touched with the hearty grief in his concluding exclamation, but said as calmly as I could. What you say is no doubt true enough, sir, but how could I know there was any peculiar ferocity in that particular whale, though indeed I might have inferred as much from the simple fact of the accident, and he might have. Okay, so he's getting an introduction there to Captain Ahab, who he will not meet for quite some time. That's one of the interesting things about um, the way that Melville writes Moby Dick, is that uh, much of it has to do with Captain Ahab. We could say that probably the driving hero or anti-hero or monster, depending on how you read Ahab, uh, uh, is, is you know, in, in the, the form of this captain, he's going to be the captain of the ship, who we don't meet for chapter after chapter after chapter after chapter. We meet our narrator uh, uh, in the, 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 the form of Ishmael, uh, but we don't meet Ahab until chapter 28. So we've got 27 chapters leading up to our introduction to Ahab. Do you think that's by design? Yeah. So why? <laughs> what, what is he doing for 27 chapters? What do you think, Isaiah? <clears throat> well, I mean, definitely trying to think of what it does. It creates tension, for mm -hmm. sure. Um, Builds the tension. A sort of... You're trying to think of expectations, yeah. right? You're trying to picture an Ahab that will eventually be revealed as the real one, and then kind of comparing and contrasting those expectations that you have versus who he actually is. Yep. Um, yeah, the anticipation and suspense builds that tension in the reader that makes it a really, really powerful experience when you do finally meet the person that's, that's been hinted at and described to you, right? Does Gatsby kind of, I mean, does the author of Gatsby, it's Fitzgerald, right? Mm -hmm. It is. Does he kind of, I just find some um, similarities here, mm -hmm. like Ishmael being, I forget the name of the character in Gatsby, yeah. who's, who's not the great Gatsby, he's yep. just getting to know him, so yep. it's through his lens. It also takes a while for us to actually get to know God, Gatsby, he's mm -hmm. throwing this, these parties and we don't know where he's at. Yep. And then we're always looking for him. We get like flashes of him. And we'll hear stories, right? Like people will tell stories of him. Yep. Is that? I want to say it's Nick is the narrator, is yep. that right? In Gatsby, that that um, you have a narrator who introduces himself to you, but then there's a long period before you actually meet the person who's kind of the central figure. Mm. Uh, and then there's an even further period after that in Gatsby before we get the big reveal. That Gatsby isn't really who he says he is. I mean, yeah, I think, I think a good storyteller uh, often delays a really important uh, reveal because it keeps you reading, okay? Uh, what else would have convinced you to read all about whaling? <laughs> you know? I mean, whaling isn't really a thing. Uh, whaling went out of style shortly after this book was written, uh, largely because they, they essentially exterminated the whale population. Um, why are people always hunting whales, by the way? Oil. Yeah, it's for their oil. Um, so it was a booming industry at this time, and it, it had literally gone under within a few years of this, this book. Um, there were different forms of energy that started being used, and uh, the whale population was, was decimated by all the whale hunting. Um, you really get a feel for the size of the whale. Oh, yeah. In the dimension, in yeah. the scene that I have a vivid recollection about where forget if it's if it's quick way or who somebody falls into the, the oil mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you, so you've got a whole person that falls yeah. into yeah. almost like a pool yeah as I recall I, I remember that too I, I remember reading Moby Dick as a child in an abridged version and there was a there was a picture of that scene you, you may remember it from the the novel where the, the whale's head is cut off I believe it's a sperm it's whale, a, yeah and the oil is found down in the in the head of the whale, so the head is cut off, it's chained up to the side of the boat, and they're, they're 
plunging uh, stakes into the uh, into the head of the whale, and something breaks and somebody falls. Somebody into that. falls in. Yeah. yeah. It's it gives you a like, sense of the dimensions. That it's almost like a farm where you have a well yes. in the backyard, yes. and, and somebody falls yeah. into the well, mm -hmm. and it, you know it's like almost like drowning. Yeah, and, it is. Uh, so so I, that just always made an impression on me about the the, the rest of the proportion. Yeah, it, it, it just the the source of the oil that you're trying to get <clears throat> has this kind of dimension. And these these ships are not that large. I mean, they're not rowboats, but they're not that large. So to take one of these ships from the 1840s or 1850s out to find one of these giant whales, especially a sperm whale, is a, is a really monumental task. But you get the heroic nature of that too. You get why this is, why this is so good for an epic. Well, that, like, like tilting at windmills. A little bit, yeah, <laughs> it is, it is. I mean, ultimately in this case, it, people turn out like that too. Um, but to this, this point of prolonging your revelation in a story, I mean, this is just basic good storytelling. Um, this is this is how you tell a story to a child. You know, you 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 prolong. You say, once upon a time, there was a mystery. You know, and all of a sudden they're like, oh. <laughs> you know? there was a bad night, but I'm not going to tell you his name. You know, and now they want to listen. Um, that's that's just a silly example, but you you see Melville, um, in essence, showing off. How long can I go before I tell you the thing you're waiting to read? And can I really keep your attention? Now, for what it's worth, most people that have read, read it initially just stop reading. <laughs> this isn't worth my time. Uh, but later generations have picked up on it. Uh, but we'll talk maybe, uh, if you're interested in why it might be that people in Melville's time weren't interested where we are now. But um, let's look at chapter 28 and uh, let's meet Ahab. For several days after leaving Nantucket, nothing above hatches was seen of Captain Ahab. The mates regularly relieved each other at the watches, and for aught that could be seen to the contrary, they seemed to be the only commanders of the ship. Only they sometimes issued from the cabin with orders so sudden and peremptory that after all it was plain they but commanded vicariously. Yes, their supreme lord and dictator was there, though hitherto unseen by any eyes not permitted to penetrate into the now sacred retreat of the cabin. Their supreme lord and dictator. He's going to be epic, isn't he? I mean, he's a, a grand... Uh, character. Let's read the description and Ishmael's um, impression of Ahab. Uh, page 134. Uh, towards the very end of the top paragraph. As I mounted the de to the deck at the call of the forenoon watch, so soon as I leveled my glance towards the taffrail, foreboding shivers ran over me. Reality outran apprehension. Captain Ahab stood upon his quarter deck. I guarantee you when, when Melville wrote reality outran apprehension, he kind of patted himself on the back. Mm -hmm. That's brilliant, isn't it? Reality outran apprehension. And that's at the core of what we've been talking about. He's been dragging you along through whaling <laughs> and all the stories about the whaling voyage. But now you get to um, your, your uh, apprehension has been outrun. Captain Ahab stood upon his quarter deck. There seemed no sign of common bodily illness about him, nor of the recovery from any. He looked like a man cut away from the stake when the fire has overrunningly wasted all the limbs without consuming them or taking away one particle from their compacted, uh, aged robustness. What do you think of that simile? Cut away from the stake when the fire has overrunningly wasted all the limbs without consuming them or taking away one particle from their compacted, aged robustness. He describes Ahab as appearing like a man who had been tied to a stake and burned, but not burned properly. <laughs> um, his whole high, broad form seemed made of solid bronze and shaped in an unalterable mold, like Killeen's cast Perseus. Uh, there you have a kind of mythical uh, sort of figure, right? Threading its way out from his gray hairs and continuing right down one side of his tawny, uh, scorched face and neck till it disappeared in his clothing. You saw a slender, rod-like mark, livish, lividly whitish. It resembled that uh, perpendicular seam sometimes made in the straight, lofty trunk of a great tree. When the upper lightning tearingly darts down it, and without wrenching a single twig, peels and grooves out of the bark from top to bottom, air running off into the soil, leaving the tree still greenly alive, but branded. What a description. Whether that mark was born with him, or whether it was the scar left by some desperate wound, 
No one could certainly say. Um, by some tacit consent throughout the voyage, little or no allusion was made to it, especially by the mates. But once, Tashtego Sr., an old gray-head Indian among the crew, superstitiously asserted that not till he was full 40 years old did Ahab become that way branded. And then it came upon him, not in the fury of any mortal fray, but in an elemental strife at sea. Yet this wild hint seemed inferentially negative by what a gray manxman insinuated, an old sepulchre man, who, having never before sailed out of Nantucket, had never ere this laid eye upon wild Ahab. Nevertheless, the old sea traditions, the immemorial, uh, the immemorial credulities popularly invested this old manxman with preternational powers of discernment, so that no white sailor ser seriously contradicted him when he said that if ever Captain a Ahab should be tran tranquilly laid out, which might hardly come to pass, so he muttered, then whoever should do that last office for the dead would find a birthmark on him from crown to soul. Uh, what's that whole passage about? It's about this scar on Ahab that's described as if it's a, a lightning bolt. Do you get the kind of epic dimensions of this? This isn't just any guy. He's a guy who has a birthmark that looks like the scar left on a tree when lightning hits it. Uh, he's he's going to be bigger than, um, he's going to be larger than life. Um, down at the bottom of the page, not a word he smoke, uh, spoke, nor did his officer say aught to him, though by all their minutest gestures and expressions, they plainly showed the uneasy, if not painful, consciousness of being under a troubled master eye. And not only that, but moody, stricken Ahab stood before them with a crucifixion in his face, in all the nameless, regal, overbearing dignity of some mighty woe. What's a crucifixion in the face? The other morning, um, my, my son woke me up and, and told me, he said, Daddy, you've been snoring. I'm like, I'm sorry? He said, you sound like a snake with a gun. <laughs> That's a great, that's a great uh, description, isn't it? Picture a snake with a gun. How does a snake hold a gun? I, I've been kind of tickled by that ever since. I'm like, what was he thinking? But it's really good, you know? He's, he's gonna be the next Melville, I guess. You know, like yeah. a snake with a gun. What is a, uh, I told my brother-in-law this, he's a professional artist, and he said, my next band, that's gonna be the name, Snake with a Gun. <laughs> uh, what is a crucifixion in a face? Yeah, it has a, yeah, maybe it's a scar. Maybe it's talking about that. Yeah, I mean, just, he looks terrible. <laughs> he looks terrible, like yes. someone crucified. Yeah. Um, you get kind of a sense uh, of what he's saying there, just in the second part of that line, in all the nameless, regal, overbearing dignity of some mighty woe. Uh, when you think of a, a crucif uh, crucifixion, you think of a victim. If you think of a crucifixion in a Christian context, you think of a, a um, innocent victim. And there is a sense in which Ahab is being set up here as some sort of uh, a victim of a great woe. Does that make sense? Um, so it's hearkening back to crucifixion generally, but also Christ's crucifixion. And he has the face of someone who's been uh, horribly treated. Who's he been horribly treated by? Well, the whale. <laughs> um, Turn the page. Nevertheless, ere long, the warm, warbling persuasiveness of the pleasant holiday weather we came to seemed gradually to charm him from his mood. For it is when the red-cheeked dancing girls, April and May, trip home to the wintry misanthropic woods, even the barest, ruggedest, most thundercloven old oak will at last, uh, will at least send forth some few green sprouts to welcome such glad-hearted visitants. So Ahab did in the end a little respond to the playful allurings of that girlish air. That is an epic simile, isn't it? Yes. Um, as when the red cheeked dancing girls, April and May, so months are described as girls, um, when they trip home to the, the woods, even the barest, ruggedest, most thundercloven old oak will at least send forth some few green sprouts. That's what Ahab was like, that old oak that can't help himself but show a little bit of life. Uh, Ahab did that when they got into warmer weather. Um, that's kind of how I felt living in Edinburgh when April came along. It's like you can't help but feel a little bit better. Uh, let's, let's try to get through chapter 31. 
which is the, the first uh, section I assigned for you. We'll break there for lunch, and we'll come back with the ending of, of um, Moby Dick. Chapter 30. Um, when Stubb, who's one of the mates... 30 or 31 now? Chapter 30. 30. Yep. Um, chapter 30. When Stubb, and Stubb is one of the mates, okay, uh, had departed, Ahab stood for a while, leaning over the bulwarks, and then, has been usual, as had been usual with him of late, calling a sailor of the watch, he sent him below for his ivory stool, and also his pipe. Lighting the pipe at the binnacle lamp, and planting the stool on the weather side of the deck, he sat and smoked. In old Norse times, the thrones of the sea-loving Dan uh, Danish kings were fabricated, saith tradition, of the tusks of the narwhal. How could one look at Ahab then, seated on that tripod of bones, without bethinking him of the royalty it symbolized? For a Khan of the plank, and a king of the sea, and a great lord of Leviathans was Ahab. Don't you see how epically he's being depicted there, like one of these Norse kings? Um, let's uh, conclude there. You can, you can um, look at chapter 31 as well, but there's nothing I wanted to comment on there. Um, when we come back, we'll be in at the ending, and I'll tell you right now that what I'm going to be focused on are going to be simply the last three chapters about the chase. Okay, I'll fill in a little bit of the blanks, but there's a lot that took place in the, the interim, but we'll be back on um, the, the final the final three chapters for the most part. That's what we'll be focused on. Um, final thoughts on that passage. Are you enjoying Moby Dick? You, you found it an enjoyable read? Uh, those of you who love words, this is the place to go. So. Um, let's uh, come back at 1.30, uh, if that works for everyone. Uh, before I, I let you out, is it okay if we take a picture of everyone uh, for Knox? That's, that's Knox's request, not mine, I assure you. I hate pictures. Uh, John Knox's request. Pictures. <laughs> John Knox is asking. I will also send you all an email because Knox at some point in the future may send a copy of the picture like or just like use our photo in whatever way you'd like. To make millions of dollars. For me personally. Uh, <laughs> I'm gonna use yours just so you know. Like no one else is I'm gonna use yours. <laughs> Are we off deck?